Bardock struggles past the guards of King Vegeta, pushing and blasting his way through. The commotion angers the king, but he recognizes the name of that low-class warrior. Bardock, a renowned warrior. He sighed as he walked to his throne. This better be worth his time. Unknown to him, the information that Bardock has will mean life or death as the evil Emperor Frieza plans their destruction. As the sun sets on planet Vegeta, Bardock pushes and shoves his way into the king's throne room, begging the king for an audience. Tired of yelling, the king waves his hand to allow Bardock to speak. Even if he was a low-class warrior, he was still legendary for his skills in battle. Bardock tries to convince the king about Frieza destroying planet Vegeta because of some things the heaters had said. The king laughs it off, but the thought remains in his mind. The king waves Bardock off of his premises, but in the next few days, he realizes that he cannot escape the idea. King Vegeta eventually decides that the possibility of Frieza destroying the planet is higher than he'd like to admit. Thus, in secret, he meets with Bardock, who had already been creating plans. Bardock was simply going to rescue his son, but to his surprise, the king arrived at his doorstep. Not only that, but he had brought the young prince and even Raditz along. With his resources and maybe even Bardock's help, King Vegeta acquires a ship with cloaking technology so power levels can't be detected. King Vegeta, Prince Vegeta, Bardock, Gine, Raditz, and Kakarot head off to Earth before planet Vegeta is vaporized. The king had some some complaints about the planet chosen, but admitted that Frieza was unlikely to go there. The king had left Nappa in charge for a couple days, but when those days became weeks, he knew something was up. Soon enough, Frieza's forces were knocking on the door, asking where the king was. But Nappa was loyal and never gave it up, until he was killed by Dodori and Zarbon. Angry, Frieza takes it out on his own soldiers. But with King Vegeta already gone, there is no way for Frieza to find where he went. Either way, this is the end of the Saiyan race. He'll have to worry about Vegeta later. Upon landing on Earth, King Vegeta immediately orders his soldiers, Bardock's family, to conquer the planet. The Saiyans didn't take long in finding the king's castle. Castle. Part of Bardock didn't feel okay with doing this, but they needed to live comfortably. After all, they were the strongest beings on the planet now. Why shouldn't they rule? The king certainly seemed excited about it, but as the king blasted through army forces, Bardock stopped firing, disheartened. He thought maybe he could have escaped the life of destruction after leaving Vegeta, but that was not the case. Gine grabbed onto Bardock. She knew what he was thinking, but the king yelled at Bardock to continue fighting, as Prince Vegeta swarms the army easily. Once they were defeated and the king kicked out, King Vegeta stepped up to give a broadcast speech through the world, declaring himself as the ruler. Over the years, under the new Saiyan rule, Earth's society changed. Capable Earthlings with strong power levels or connections to the king are given higher status over the rest, though they only serve as Cybermen while Vegeta trained. He even killed some, like General Blue, accidentally during sparring. Master Shen decided to betray humanity and became King Vegeta's advisor in order to get in his good graces and achieve a higher standing in this new world order. But Bardock's heart was never in it, even while living comfortably. In fact, he thought them being so outspoken about ruling Earth could be detrimental and potentially reveal their location. Gine agreed with Bardock, though they never spoke to each other about it. She hated seeing her husband like this, not realizing that he was doing this against his own will. She was scared of the king, and especially the prince. She was worried about the influence he was having on Raditz, and eventually Kakarot. Raditz loved that they had taken over Earth and was fiercely loyal to the prince. Eventually, while Bardock was doing one of his chores, picking up loads of meat for the castle, somebody fired a blast at him. It was a young martial artist with no nose and no hair. It didn't hurt very much, but it was impressive. He rushed in, ready to kill, but stopped himself, pulling his arm down and just leaving. In his face, not only did he see Kakarot, but also the face of Granola, the young Cerulean he saved a few years back. Once he returned, he had a heart-to-heart -heart with Gine. He explained his thoughts, and she was surprised, though Bardock expressed that he was afraid of the king. Gine took a step forward and slapped Bardock, telling him to never be afraid, especially not of a man like that. She asked him if he ever dared to check his power level before. Bardock shook his head no, since scouters could give them away to Frieza. Gine says that she had done that before, and she knows for a fact that Bardock is stronger than the king, that Bardock can defeat the king, but the prince, he's a different beast. They need training.
Bardock went back to where the kid had attacked before and found that he was there once again. This time he was just watching until an old, bald man dragged him away. The pattern repeated itself for a few days, until one time he finally took Gine and Kakarot as well. This time he followed them and found them going into Capsule Corp. Inside, in actuality, was a secret base where the world's greatest fighters had gathered together in order to find a way to defeat the Saiyans. Master Roshi, Grandpa Gohan, a young Krillin Tian Chaozu, the Ox King Chi Chi Nam, and even Mr. Satan gathered together. Krillin was raised a normal martial artist since he was born. So, although he was only around 8 years old, he was knowledgeable, especially after he was taken in by Master Roshi, as he searched for warriors in every school he could think of, while Tien saw the wrong in his master's way early on, leaving with Shoutsu. In the middle of the conversation, Bardock and Gine broke through the door, where they were immediately attacked by everyone. Boma had weapons, while everyone else blasted. None was too powerful, but Boma's weapons were impressive, even feeling as if his tail was being grabbed. Somehow, they had figured out the weakness of the Saiyans. Bardock was tired of it, blowing them all back. He looked at the pieces of Boma's weapon, destroyed. Now that was impressive. You all are exactly what Gine and I need. Listen, if you are smart enough to make this, then you are all smart enough to fight. And a fight is what we need. Gohan asked what the name of the young kid was as he slowly approached. Come on everyone, look at them, look at him. This boy hasn't done anything wrong. For him, for our kids, it's worth trusting them. Isn't that right, young Kakarot? They soon joined the rebellion. They all had individual stories, such as Bulma running away for a short period of time, and Ten Shinhan, who had become a world-renowned gladiator at King Vegeta's annual gladiator games. Bardock gave them hints about defeating the Saiyans, trained with them, and even gave Bulma the idea of building a gravity chamber. But as they made plans to storm the castle, Bardock brings up the idea of the Cybermen and Raditz, and how none of them are strong enough just yet. They need strong fighters to train. As a last resort, Roshi brought up Piccolo, much to the behest of Gohan. Roshi says that if they can control him, he could be an incredible asset. Thus, they found the Mafaba Jar and freed the Demon King. Bardock admitted that he and his kids were impressive, but they would need a lot more training. Piccolo retorted with an attack, but Bardock easily stopped them. Bardock lied to King Piccolo, telling him that he was free to rule Earth if they were victorious. Some time passes, and the Z fighters train, with no news of the betrayal reaching the king. However, both the humans and the elite both get news of the Dragon Balls around the same time. From Roshi and the Crane Hermit, respectively, both factions spread through the world, trying to obtain them, with Bardock helping the king, but in reality, finding them for Roshi with the Dragon Radar. The first Dragon Ball is found at a Capsule Corp attic. The second one is with Roshi, as he had kept it as a necklace for many years. The third one is with Bardock. A few years back, the royal family received pleas from Aru Village about a demon that was kidnapping young daughters. King Vegeta refused to help since they were just worthless peasants, but Bardock decided to help instead. Bardock defeats Oolong easily, arresting him and rescuing the village girls. As a token of their appreciation, and though a little scared, the village rewards him with a Dragon Ball. He gave it to Gine as a present. The fourth Dragon Ball was in the burning castle at Mount Frypan. Both the rebel forces and the crown's elite guard arrived at the same time, tracking its signal. The rebels, Kakarot, Boma, Yamcha, Puar, and Chichi, and the royal guard, Raditz, and some other fight as the Dragon Ball eventually lands in the hands of the rebels. Raditz couldn't believe what he was seeing, but Kakarot was not only fighting against them, but he was getting much, much stronger. Bardock had told Kakarot not to go after them, since he could run into his brother, but now it was too late. Raditz approached Bardock about this, and he told him that he would reprimand his brother for playing games like that. But Raditz remained cautious, distrustful of his father. The fifth Dragon Ball was in the Pilaf castle, and the sixth is with Gohan. Gohan was arrested by the royal guard and placed in a maximum security prison. The rebels have a plan to break him out and bust Gohan out of prison. When the rebels break out Gohan and ask where the Dragon Ball is, he reveals that he ate it before the guards took him in. Bulma gives him some pills and eventually they get handed the Dragon Ball. The final Dragon Ball was with Bulma as she managed to take it from the castle as her father works under threat of death. The king is angry that they can't find the Dragon Balls, admitting that this would be a lot more helpful if they were a little bit smarter and Dr. Briefs worked faster, not knowing that Dr. Briefs was perfectly capable of creating a Dragon Radar. 
he just refused. But as Goku was flying away, retrieving the final Dragon Ball to the secret location, which was let sealed, thus no Dragon Radar could detect it, the Pilaf gang revealed that they had finally constructed their own Dragon Radar. Without wasting any time, King Vegeta himself leads the way, but it's to his surprise that they find Kakarot holding the ball. He congratulates the kid in finding it, and tells him to hand it over. When he refuses, Raditz starts to get nervous, and tells his brother to do as the king says. The king looks at Bardock, cocking an eyebrow, asking him what the hell he's been teaching that kid. But something sparks within Bardock. He perks up and looks behind Kakarot. He can sense it. He couldn't believe it, but he could actually sense Ki. All that time with Master Roshi and the rest had really helped, and he could sense the rebellion army approaching. Without wasting a beat, Bardock says, But this life of destruction is a life I can no longer lead. Take this! The king's eyes widen as he gets blasted, and all of the army arrives. Raditz vs Kakarot, Cybermen vs the army, Gine vs the king, and Bardock vs the prince. They all switch between opponents, with Gine being severely hurt. Though, thanks to the couple of years of training in the gravity chamber against Bardock, as well as the help of Corrin with the holy water, all of the humans are much stronger, and they are able to support the Saiyans. An amusing sight is seeing Master Roshi and King Piccolo as Piccolo leads his army of demons and Roshi the army of humans. A giant Kiko Ho gets rid of a large portion of the Cybermen, while Roshi, Gohan, Krillin, and even Kakarot fire Kamehamehas all together at the Prince. Goku made sure to protect Chi Chi, as the two of them had grown very close together. Bardock told them to do what they can to get rid of the tails of the enemy, while lamenting having to fight his own son, telling him that this isn't the way, that they don't have to rule over them, they can just simply live together. But Raditz wouldn't listen, but Bardock didn't have the heart to fight him, letting the humans and Kakarot deal with him. No matter what they try, they aren't able to cut the king's tail off, and their Time was running out. Tonight was a full moon, and as it began to shine in the sky, Bardock, Gine, Kakarot, Raditz, Vegeta, and the King all turned into Ozaru. The King and the Prince were the only ones to remain in control, while the others fought indiscriminately. Thankfully, them being attacked by the King made them angry, and Bardock's family focused on them. This battle rocked the whole world, and though Bardock's family seemed to be the stronger one this time, merely because of numbers, they weren't nearly as refined as the Prince. Bulma utilized her machine, the one that focused on the Saiyan's tails, to slow them all down, in order for the fighters to blast out their tails. King Piccolo declared himself as the ruler of the world, as he aimed directly at the tail of Raditz, firing a finger blast that took the ape down. In response, King Vegeta slapped King Piccolo away like a fly, followed by a mouth beam. Right before it hit, King Piccolo gave birth to one final egg, firing it as far away as possible to make sure that he left a legacy behind. All the other demons rushed in at King Vegeta, giving everyone else a chance to take his tail down. It was only a matter of time until those demons died, and slowly the Ozaru came falling down. Raditz was the first to go down, then the king, then Gine. Finally Bardock, but the prince was never hit. Without much of a choice, Bardock took a gamble, running in between the prince's legs, grabbing onto his tail and slamming him into the ground. All the Saiyans were a little confused and couldn't stand correctly. They weren't used to walking without their tails. That's when Bardock yelled at them to use the Dragon Balls right now. Gohan looked at Bardock in the eyes, asking in that stare if he was sure. Bardock simply nodded. Meanwhile, the king yelled at Pilaf and his allies to use the Dragon Balls to wish for their tail to grow back. Bulma and Pilaf both rushed to the Dragon Balls, and as Shenron was summoned, they both yelled out their wish at the exact same time, while the Prince, Raditz, and the King fired their blasts, and Gine, Bardock, and Kakarot responded with their own. One of the wishes was made, and a bright light consumes everyone. Just as the blast exploded in the middle, smoke surrounded them all, unsure which wish had been granted. But as Bardock stepped up and extended his hand out to the King, it was clear, it was not the one the king wanted. He asked what the hell he wished for, and Bardock turned around slowly. I wished for Earth to forget us, because a king whom no one knows is no king at all. An angry Prince Vegeta wants to attack, but the king stops him, saying that it's over. They have been bested, and at the end of the day, Bardock 
as the new king gets to declare what to do. Bardock says that he's right, he is the king, and his first declaration is for them all to live peacefully now, to blend in among the rest of the humans. And with that, no Saiyan will have the crown. But Prince Vegeta and Raditz were both upset, saying that this was ridiculous. How did they expect to defeat Frieza if they couldn't even rule over this planet? But for now, he had to let it go. Even he didn't have that much strength left. And so, some time passes, and Earth goes back to normal. Boma goes through her boxes in her attic, where she discovers an old photo with old friends. She looks at the picture and sees Kakarot, Gine, and Bardock. She immediately starts to tear up, but she doesn't understand and why. As far as she knows, she has no idea who these people are, but they seem so familiar to her. Meanwhile, Krill and Tien, Yamcha and Chi Chi start to have similar events where they can't seem to recall someone important. There's something missing in their heart. Krill and Tien, Yamcha and Boma meet up as Boma shows them the picture and asks if they know who these people are. King Vegeta lives alone on the mountains, a simple old man watching the world go around him, though Bardock visits him often. Bardock, Gine, Raditz, and Kakarot live on Earth all together, and though Raditz doesn't like his brother nor his family very much, and prefers to spend time with King Vegeta, he has mellowed out through the years. Prince Vegeta, however, decided to go around the world, traveling, finding ways to get stronger in order to defeat Frieza, never giving up on his goal, sometimes causing havoc. And it's during those times when Kakarot has to step up and try to stop him, though it never goes beyond a few altercations when humans make him upset. And Kakarot never quite beats him, but Vegeta recognizes his strength, slowly growing to appreciate him as a rival. Some more time passes, with Chi Chi now being a teenager. She's in Mount Frypan, picking up flowers when a figure appears nearby. She makes eye contact as the figure reveals himself to be Kakarot. He smiles at her as he undoes his turban, revealing the unruly hair. Chi Chi's eyes widen. She could recognize this boy, but she didn't know from where. Goku simply smiles and reintroduces himself, saying that if his memory serves right, asking her for her name. And finally, for a battle against her, he wants to see just how strong she's gotten. It has been six years since the defeat of King Vegeta. King Vegeta lives peacefully in the outskirts of West City. Bardock and Gine live by Gohan, making sure him and the rest of the warriors were okay, but never approaching. Goku and Chichi live together, having a one-year-old Gohan. After Goku approached her, the, the two begin a relationship with Boma and the other warriors who knew Chichi, finding out about Goku and his strange monkey tail for the first time. Ever since Bardock and the rest wished for everyone's memory to disappear. One day, Vegeta approaches his father. He had something in his mind for a while, asking the king why he gave up so easily. King Vegeta tells him that he realized in that fateful battle for the Dragon Balls that his fighting spirit died when he realized that there was no one willing to stand by him. A king whom no one knows is no king at all. Remember, son? Vegeta was angry. He couldn't believe his father had given up. He would take it upon himself to escape this planet and defeat Frieza once and for all. Raditz and Vegeta traveled through the world looking for the Dragon Balls. No one knows exactly why, but one day, Vegeta shows up in front of Bulma at Capsule Corp. She is scared, as she doesn't know who this is, all her memories of the Saiyans having been erased. Vegeta explained that he isn't there to harm her, he's just there for the Dragon Balls and the Dragon Radar. Bulma refuses to give it up, she doesn't know what he'll do with them. Vegeta is getting angry and he begins to rise his key, but a being assumes forward, punching Vegeta across the face. Raditz is surprised to realize that it was Piccolo. After the grand battle, he had been found by Dr. Briefs and raced to work at Capsule Corp. While training in the gravity chamber Dr. Briefs had built for the battles against the Saiyans. Originally, he wanted to kill the person who killed his father, but the memory of who that was soon went away and he was just left an angry child. But Boma and the rest took care of him, and over time, he slowly changed, growing to appreciate his family. Vegeta commented on how he was surprised to see this Namekian still around. Piccolo defended Boma. Even if Vegeta was stronger, Vegeta didn't have time for this. All he wanted to do was kill Frieza and escape this rock. Vegeta seems defeated, like he had spent years of his life trying to leave, but he knew he wasn't strong enough. Bulma's heart sank. It seemed to her like he needed help. She asked just who Frieza was, and 
Vegeta replies that he's an evil emperor that destroyed his planet years ago. His tail, which had regrown after the battle, swung behind him. Bulma recognized that tail. It was the same tail as Goku, Chi Chi's husband. She had known that girl for six years, but she didn't know where from. Same with Krillin, Tien, and the others. Where had these monkey tailed aliens come from? She wanted to find out. Maybe through him, she could. Maybe she could help him. She tells Piccolo to stand down, that she's going to help Vegeta. Piccolo argues, but he finally gives in. Vegeta is surprised, as Bulma tells him that she will help him, but that she needs to know the wish. Vegeta says simply, Immortality. Bulma laughed, but agreed to let him have the wish. Piccolo thought she was insane, but she said that they would leave and let her and the planet alone. It was a win-win. Bulma winked at Vegeta, who blushed. Thus, over the course of the next month, Vegeta, Raditz, Piccolo, and Bulma go out looking for the Dragon Balls. But this didn't go unnoticed by Goku and Bardock, who could feel their ki flying around everywhere. It was curious. They weren't sure what they were doing. Goku thought about approaching them, but Bardock stopped him, telling him that he has a suspicion and and that they'd go see King Vegeta to make sure. Meanwhile, Bulma and the rest were finding the Dragon Balls all over the world, with Bulma getting in a little bit of trouble here and there, being attacked by the boss rabbit. Vegeta was forced to defend her, which surprised Raditz. Even three years ago, Vegeta would have simply let her die and used the Dragon Radar without her. Perhaps he didn't want to deal with Piccolo? He wasn't entirely sure, but it was clear to him that over time, Bulma and Vegeta were getting closer and closer. But it wasn't all peach and gravy. Piccolo and the Saiyans often fought each other, creating some sort of rivalry, even though they were aiming to kill sometimes. Each one of the members of this team got stronger and stronger. But back with Goku and Bardock, they approached King Vegeta and had a small conversation about the state of things. He seems quiet, older than he should be, like the years had really gotten to him. Finally, Bardock asked what exactly Vegeta was doing. That's when King Vegeta said, Doing what neither of us could do, Bardock. Escaping and killing Frieza. Bardock's eyes widened, realizing just exactly what they were flying all over Earth for. They needed to stop him, now. Worried about what Raditz might do, Bardock and Goku approached them as they collected a Dragon Ball from underwater. Gine had wished them luck, having created her own catering service over the past few years. Anyways, over the seas, Vegeta crossed his arms, while Bulma looked at him, Piccolo and Raditz, from within the submarine. Goku asked what the hell they were doing, and Vegeta said, Scaping and defeating Frieza. Bardock said that this was a stupid idea, and they would just bring attention to Earth and get them all in danger. Vegeta was having none of it, however, and summoned both Raditz and Piccolo to fight them. Goku rushed in at Piccolo while Raditz took on Bardock. To their surprise, both were much stronger than expected. After all, Vegeta had been training with both of them in between fighting the Dragon Balls. But Goku and Bardock were pushing them back, to the point where Vegeta told them that if they were going to try to stop him, then they're gonna have to catch him first. He snatched the Dragon Radar from Bulma's submarine, and rushed out. Bulma was freaking out. She couldn't believe what was happening. Bardock told Goku to go after him, but he was stopped by Piccolo and Raditz, told Bulma to get away, and he would explain things later. But she was hot-headed, and went after Vegeta instead. Bardock too was stopped by Raditz. Goku laughed, having wondered just exactly how strong he would be. After all, his father wasn't that powerful. Piccolo's eyes widened, so this must have been the guy. Goku denied it. No, it was not him. In fact, he fought alongside him. But it was clear to Goku that Piccolo had already far surpassed his father. The two clashed overhead, while Bardock tried to reason with Raditz, telling him that his blind loyalty to Vegeta wasn't the right thing. Raditz shook his head. This wasn't blind loyalty. It was what he wanted wanted to do. He wanted to leave this rock, take over planets like in the good old days, or at the very least, live without fear. He didn't understand how his father could just sit still. A better Saiyan would have taken over this planet already, just like King Vegeta had planned to long ago. Bardock was upset that Raditz was talking like this, and realized that he would have to teach him a lesson, rushing in to attack his son. But Raditz fired a double Sunday. Bardock was hit, but quickly recovered, grabbed his son in a full Nelson, and crashed down words with him. Meanwhile, Piccolo and Goku actually seemed to be on par with one another. Bardock was watching the fight and was blindsided by an attack from Raditz. The blast struck him and paralyzed him for a minute, while Raditz went up to the sky, grabs Goku, while Piccolo charts his own attack, the special beam cannon. He didn't aim to kill, just 
severely maimed. But just as he fired it, Bardock pushed both of his sons out of the way, his arm being nearly destroyed as the attack hit him. At that moment, Bardock took the chance to talk to Piccolo, telling him exactly who they were, that they were Saiyans, and that the evil Emperor Frieza was going to come after them if he ever found out that they were there. Bardock and Goku both fought side by side with King Piccolo and Bulma, but their memories had to be erased. In order to defeat King Vegeta, Vegeta was putting everyone, not just the Saiyans, at risk. Frieza was far more powerful than anyone they had ever seen. Piccolo was unconvinced until Goku mentioned Bulma, saying that Vegeta is just putting Bulma in danger. Piccolo had a hard time believing it. After all, he'd seen the way Bulma and Vegeta had been getting close, but he sighed. He knew they were right. But as Piccolo was about to join them, Raditz just continued telling him to attack. In response, Bardock appeared behind Raditz and chopped him in the back of the neck, knocking him out. Piccolo and Goku nodded at each other, rushing towards Vegeta once more. Vegeta goes on to find another Dragon Ball from within a volcano, with only one Dragon Ball left to find. Looking at the Dragon Radar, Vegeta realized that it was approaching him. His eyes widened to see Goku arrive with the final Dragon Ball, the Four Star. Bardock was carrying the unconscious Raditz, while a hurt Piccolo went along with Goku and Bardock. He had hurt them out, and understood why Vegeta should be stopped. He never agreed with his methods anyways, and thought Bulma was being ridiculous. The three began to battle against Vegeta, but he was far too strong for any of them individually. Once they began to work together, however, it became easier, and Vegeta was being pushed back. It was impressive just how quickly Vegeta could adapt to fighting three people, using every part of his body to fight. His tail, his arms, and his legs. He had improved so much since the last time they fought, clearly being able to read Ki now. It came to a point where he was surrounded, Goku firing the Kamehameha, Bardock his Rebellion Blaster, and Piccolo the Makan Kozapo. But Vegeta dodged in such a way that they actually nearly struck each other. Vegeta laughed, rushing towards Piccolo, kneeing him in the stomach, then throwing him at Bardock. Goku and Vegeta stared each other down, taking their battle stances and crashing against each other, rocks breaking apart around them. In the meantime, Bulma chased after them. It was hard to keep up, but she had a rough idea of where the Dragon Ball Vegeta was looking for was at. She cursed under her breath, wondering to herself if what they were saying about Vegeta was true, but above that, worrying if he was okay. Bulma caught up to them and demanded to know what was happening, but Vegeta told her to shut up and give him the Dragon Ball she had. It was clear that he was losing his grip. They tried to tell him to calm down, that it was gonna be okay. They could find another way to defeat Frieza, but he refused, with Bardock getting in the way between Vegeta and Bulma. Vegeta began to take steps backwards and laugh, taking something in his hand. Bardock told him to stop, but Vegeta threw something at the sky, saying, Burst open and mix! Thinking quickly, Bardock grabbed his own tail and ripped it off, but it was too late for Kakarot, as he and the prince transformed into an Ozaru. Vegeta laughed as Goku began to rampage and the battle began. Bardock told Piccolo to come and help him. They battled the Ozaru, trying to take off their tails, but Ozaru Vegeta was way too strong and way too fast. Bulma tried pleading with Vegeta to stop that this wasn't right as Bardock told him to be careful. Thankfully, Piccolo was having an easier time against Goku, becoming giant and battling the Ozaru. He managed to push him back, grabbed him by the tail, spun him, and threw him off ripping his tail clean off and defeating the monster. But this only made Vegeta angrier. Vegeta fired various blasts at the two. Piccolo did everything he could to dodge out of the way, but one landed, and he was sent hurling into the ground, creating a huge crater. Bulma was getting really freaked out, running out of her ship and continuing to yell at Vegeta. Bardock kept yelling at Bulma to get out of here, that this is too dangerous. She refused. She believed in Vegeta. Bardock and Ozaru Vegeta blasted at each other, creating a beam struggle that blew trees away from their roots. But Vegeta defeated Bardock, nearly breaking his other arm. Goku slowly regained consciousness and couldn't believe that they were still fighting Vegeta. As he began to stomp harder and harder until Bulma tripped and her eyes widened, suddenly Vegeta's heart sank. He screamed a pained no and kneeled down scooping Bulma up. She was dying. He could feel her key falling. He had stepped on her. Piccolo cursed, rushing in to fight Vegeta, but he was simply ignoring his attacks. Over the course of the Dragon Ball hunt, he had gotten so close to Bulma. She treated him like a person, not just a monster. Bardock flew up to Piccolo, stopping him and talking to Vegeta. He said, You see, Vegeta, this wasn't the answer. Frieza can wait. We need to keep a low profile. We can't interact with these humans. No? 
We can't. Your son married a human. I just wanted to leave this rock, defeat Frieza and escape. I didn't... I don't want to live in fear. Well, it's too late now. The words of his father return to him for a moment, about a king whom no one remembers. He finally understands his father, and he was right. A king is nothing without the people who stand by him. People to fight for. No, it's not over. Vegeta took back the artificial moon, shrinking it and de-transforming. As Bulma's body laid peacefully, Vegeta took the final Dragon Ball from Goku and summoned the dragon. I am the eternal dragon. Why have you summoned me? Vegeta, no! Eternal dragon! I wish. I wish for Bulma to be returned to life. Your wish is granted. Bardock and the rest stood speechless. He gave up his own wish of immortality as the Dragon Ball spread and Bulma slowly woke up. Vegeta looked away from everyone. He hoped that this was the last time he ever saw them. As Bardock was about to ask something, Vegeta flew away. Raditz quickly followed, even though Bardock tried to stop him. Goku put a hand on Bardock, shaking his head. The two eventually explained everything to Bulma, where they came from, why they are here, and why Vegeta knew about the Dragon Balls. Bulma was pissed that her memories were tampered with, but even more upset about what Vegeta did. She grew to know him as a person, a person she could love. She couldn't believe that this was him. Bardock took Bulma and Piccolo back to Capsule Corp, telling them that they will meet again. Bulma went to her window and wondered where Vegeta had gone. Far away, deep in space, Vegeta stood over the body of a green alien, yet his head cut off. Vegeta's panting, tired, blood on his glove. It was clear that he had just massacred whoever that was. Raditz wraps his tail around his waist once more. He too is standing over a body, this one, a purple man. Raditz asked who was next. Vegeta said that it didn't matter. All of them had to perish. One way or the other, Vegeta had been hunting down members of the Frieza Force, though he knew it was impossible to get them all. Soon enough, he would be ready to face off against Frieza. As we skip ahead and see how Vegeta blasts away Zarbon and Dodoria, making his way through the castle. Vegeta and Raditz take steps forward in the throne room of Frieza. They both take a knee. Prince Vegeta, what an honor. I had thought your family had died. I'm glad to have you here to serve me once more. <laughs> serve you? No, I'm here to kill you. It has been a few months since Vegeta and Raditz left Earth in search for Frieza. After failing to wish for immortality, they instead resorted to more drastic measures by hunting down members of the Frieza Force. Though they made quick work of Kui, Goldoro, Zarbon, and Dodoria, they knew Frieza would be a much harder enemy to battle against. Bardock, Gine, and Kakarot are worried about what they could have been up to, but they couldn't risk going out there and looking for them. It would just mean more death and destruction, but their questions were soon answered as the ship crashed down back on Earth. Raditz arrives, hurt. He warns that Frieza knows their location, and though Goku and the others are on guard, they're quick to help him up. The older brother explains that Vegeta never gave up their location. Instead, it was Raditz himself. He was too weak-minded. He couldn't take the punishment. He was only let go to make sure that Frieza got a fair fight once he arrived on Earth. A sweat drop falls from Goku's face, asking Raditz where the hell Vegeta is. Bardock, Goku, and the others wonder what's happened to Vegeta, and they'll find out soon enough. We cut to Vegeta in chains, as Frieza slaps him. It's clear that Vegeta had been used as a training dummy for a few days by Frieza. It didn't look like he could take any more, but even so, he still had the goal to spit at the Emperor. Frieza chuckles. He doesn't care about his insolence. He can kill him at any moment, but he's still valuable for now. Frieza turns around, asking how long until they reach Earth. Apul says, a month. A month? Bardock replies. They need to prepare. It's time for the Saiyans to reveal themselves to humanity. Goku goes to Chi Chi, informing her of the incoming threat to Earth. He says that he wants to train little Gohan. Chi Chi is unsure and doesn't know if revealing themselves is a good idea, but Goku says that Chi Chi and Gohan are the only ones in danger. The whole world is. With a sigh and a little bit of convincing, Chi Chi agrees. After all, in this timeline, Chi Chi is much more of a fighter, having had to fight for a lot of her life. The first people they go to are Bulma and Piccolo. 
Piccolo. Piccolo is a skeptical and doesn't care for Vegeta because of what happened with Bulma after she died at Vegeta's hands some time ago. But Bulma insists that the time they spent together had been special. She realized that Vegeta wasn't that bad of a guy. He was just misled. Bardock thanks her as she says that she'll gather the best fighter she knows. Bardock starts to walk away and Bulma asks where he's going, to which he simply responds with, I'm going to see an old friend. In an old shed, Bardock goes to visit King Vegeta and tells him that he's needed one more time. But the king refuses, not even looking at Bardock. It doesn't matter what it is, he's given up that life after the painful defeat he had in front of Bardock. But Bardock explains that Frieza is coming, but he just refuses. The rebel Saiyan begins to walk away, and as he does, he says, You know, they have the prince too. Bardock exits the area as King Vegeta's aura emanates and sparks up in anger, but he remains seated in his chair. We then cut to Capsule Corp, where the Z fighters gather. Goku, Gohan, Krillin, Piccolo, Tien, Yamcha, Mesh Grandpa Gohan, Gine, Chichi, Raditz, and Yajirobe. Everybody is wondering why they've been summoned. They have no memories of each other, only pictures of them together. They have tried to figure out how these pictures came to be, but they never really got an answer. But Bulma, she finally knew. After the events with Vegeta, she found out. Bardock explains who the Saiyans are. He worked alongside the Z fighters of Earth to find fight and bring down King Vegeta's rule of Earth. He reveals that after the battle, he wished for everyone on Earth to forget the struggles they endured and the Saiyans themselves. Everyone is in a state of confusion, and they go from being shocked to saddened by the news. Tien tells them that whatever it is they need help with, they can forget it. He refuses to team up with someone who had brought more harm to Earth than good. Master Roshi speaks up and says that as martial artists, they have already defended Earth more ways than one, and that not only only are their lives at stake, but the entirety of Earth. It's their duty to defend the planet. Tien knows that Roshi's telling the truth, but says that even if he wanted to help, he has no idea how they're expected to get so strong in such a short amount of time. That's when Grandpa Gohan steps forward, saying that he might have a little idea as he takes out the power pole. Piccolo responds in a snap, saying, Of course, that old man must have a wait for us to train. Master Roshi's eyes widened, realizing what they're talking about. At Kami's lookout, Kami asks Piccolo for his opinion on the Saiyans, and whether or not they can be trusted, as they both watch the rest of the fighters climb up Korin Tower, with Roshi leading the gang, and Bardock actually struggling a little bit. Piccolo exclaims that he isn't sure, but right now, they don't have an option. This Frieza guy has the potential to wipe out all of life on Earth. For once, he should trust his other half. Kami, Popo, Roshi, and Grappa Gohan leave the rest of the warriors in training, as they eat each individually improve. They get stronger massively thanks to the training against the Saiyans. Mr. Popo starts to hype up the time chamber, and Bardock is very interested, but he allows the other fighters to enter first. But slowly, they realize that none of them can stay there for long, not even Kakarot. There just seems to be something that they lack, a push for it. Bardock is unsure about the chamber, but that's when he feels an immense power behind them. They all turn around to see King Vegeta wearing his royal cape for the first time in years. King Vegeta simply says, Bardock, let's save my son. He had followed Bardock's scouter's signature towards the lookout. He then takes that set scouter and crushes it in his palm, explaining that he's done relying on it, and it's time for him and Bardock to settle the score. The Z fighters are on guard, but Bardock reassures them that they don't need to worry. He is now a new ally, a powerful one at that. The two of them walk into the time chamber together. In the meantime, Goku trains Gohan along with the rest of the fighters as he learns a lot about life. He apologizes to them all individually, saying that he's sorry that he didn't reach out sooner and that he really did miss them as friends. It seems that over time, they start to remember him too. Raditz and Gine begin to bond over their training too, as he really did miss his family. Family. Soon enough, Bardock and King Vegeta step out of the time chamber, both of them visibly hurt and barely standing. Goku can't believe it. Their power had skyrocketed since the last time they saw them. This was the motivation the Z fighters needed, to step into the time chamber one more time and give it a true shot. This time, they could do it. In pairs, the Z fighters continue to train within the room of spirit and time, gradually getting stronger and stronger until that fateful day arrives. Frieza brings his army and the Ginyu Force to the all-out war. As the spaceship looms overhead, the Z fighters are ready, standing tall at the battle site. 
as many forces begin to pour out of the ship. First is the random soldiers, then Frieza, whose power shakes everyone, and finally the Ginyu Force right behind him, with Vegeta in a shock collar next to them. He has been forced to be part of the Ginyu Force for this battle, so he must do poses and moves, or else he'll be shocked. The Z Fighters say that they don't have time for these random minions, as Piccolo, Krillin, and the rest use area of attack moves to wipe out large portions of them. The scatter Kamehameha, even something akin to the Hellzone Grenade. In the end, Piccolo and Tien take on the Ginyu Force by themselves, as they're strong enough to do so. King Vegeta also helps out in order to free his son. They can't believe it, but they've actually gotten strong enough to fight against the Ginyu Force, and all thanks to Bardock and the Saiyans' immense training. Not to mention the various Zenkai they got during the first war against King Vegeta and the second struggle against the Prince. Piccolo and King Vegeta, in a combo move, are able to take the controller out of Ginyu's hand, destroying it and ripping the collar from Vegeta. He thanks his father, though he's extremely hurt. Bardock flies next to him, saying, Kid, catch. Giving Prince Vegeta a sensu bean. Vegeta nods at the older Saiyan. There's an understanding between the two that he really is sorry for what happened. But now it's no time for apologies. They must fight against Frieza. Bulma runs to Vegeta, hugging him from behind, saying that she's glad to see that he's okay. Vegeta kind of pushes her off, but can't help but crack a smile, telling her to get out of there. Things are about to get ugly. As he turns back to look at Ginyu, stepping forward, King Vegeta by his side, and soon being joined by Krillin, Tien and the others. The team takes on the Ginyu Force, giving them no time to breathe. And remember, they're off one member, as Vegeta had already killed Goldo. Vegeta has fought the Ginyu Force before at this point, and he knows a lot of their tricks already, giving pointers to the rest of the Z Fighters. Ginyu even tries to switch bodies with Vegeta, but Piccolo saves him by extending his hand out and pulling Vegeta out of the way. Vegeta says he doesn't need any help from the Namekian. But even so, in a combined Kamehameha, Makan Kozapo, Gallic Gun, Kiko Ho and others, the team defeat the Ginyu Force, with Grandpa Gohan and Master Roshi telling them how proud they were. But now they could rest. They were extremely hurt. The human Z Fighters could no longer fight. They had used the rest of their power in that final blast. All that was left now was Frieza. As the Bardock family looks on at the Emperor. Ah, oh, I must admit, I'm quite impressed by what you've done. You've gotten so powerful, my dear King Vegeta. And, uh, what was your name? Well, it doesn't matter. After all, you know mine. You have the great honor to know the name of the Emperor Frieza. Well then, shall we begin? The Bardock family takes on Frieza, fighting well together, but start to quickly lose ground once Frieza starts to transform. First, Raditz is pierced through the chest by second form Frieza, then the Z Fighters are all hit by various death beams from third form Frieza, and just to mess with them, Frieza transforms into his final form, as it seems like only King Vegeta, the Prince, Goku, Bardock, Gine, and Piccolo are the only ones that can remain fighting. It seems like Frieza is torturing them, making sure sure not to kill them in order to make them suffer. But one Saiyan doesn't back down from the fight. One Saiyan puts all of her will and motivation to keep fighting, that one being Gine. Gine, even though being weaker than the others, puts up most of the fight just out of pure raw will and her instincts to protect her family. And Kid Gohan is right next to her. Even though Goku and Chi Chi tell him to stand back, he refuses to leave his grandmother's side. Frieza is intrigued by this, so he focuses focuses on torturing her. Gohan gets very angry very quickly, getting a huge power boost from seeing his grandmother in this state, attacking Frieza with all his might. This actually manages to catch Frieza off guard, as the Emperor gets angry and kicks Gohan away, sending a death beam right after him. But Gine gets in the way. Gine falls to the ground, holding her grandson, but he soon realizes that she is gone. As a tear from Gohan falls onto Gine's face, Goku, Bardock, and Raditz all trigger the same transformation. The three great Super Saiyans exploding in raw energy, but even so. 
Through the battle against the three Saiyans, none of them are quite powerful enough to defeat Frieza on their own. But working together, they have a real chance. King Vegeta and the Prince couldn't believe it. This transformation coming from the low class, Vegeta begins to rant about it, but the King puts a hand on his son's shoulder, saying that, We no longer live in that kind of society, son. This is a world where even a low class Saiyan can defeat an elite if he trains hard enough. There is no wall they can't surpass. We just have to keep that mindset and climb those walls too. The fight is long, tiring, and hurtful. Frieza, even after going 100%, starts to lose power. The four of them are very tired and hurt, but eventually Frieza starts to lose, his stamina draining quicker than any of the three Saiyans. And as it seems they all can defeat him, Goku, Bardock, and Raditz stand before Frieza, key balls in hand. But they all feel the prince and King Vegeta's power rise behind them. Bardock smirks, saying, I'm not gonna kill you, but I'm not gonna save you either. As all members of Bardock's family rush away, King Vegeta takes the lead, both royals charging up a Gallic gun to finally decimate the Emperor once and for all. It was over. It seemed like Frieza really was defeated. All the Saiyans and Z fighters gather around Gine's body. As Goku hugs Chi-Chi and picks up Gohan, Piccolo says that he's sorry for their loss but that there's something they can do. After the battle ends, the Earth's casualties are undone thanks to the Dragon Balls and Bulma's help gathering them. Similar to King Piccolo's defeat in the original story, a lot of people were aware of this battle and they begin to see some of the Saiyans and the Z Fighters as heroes with a monument being erected in their honor. But even so, except for Yamcha and maybe Krillin, still live peaceful, isolated lives. Bardock's just happy. They've avenged their comrades and save the world. And above that, they got Prince Vegeta and Raditz back. Bardock stands in front of Grandpa Gohan's house. The family had moved not too far away from his. Gine walks up to her husband with little Gohan in hand. Bardock picks up his grandson and smiles at Gine, telling her that he'll train and get stronger. He's going to protect her and this little guy. He's never gonna let anything happen to them ever again. However, an unknown organization had been preparing something as they quote-unquote see through the facade that Capsule Corp had been creating. These Saiyans were not heroes. They were alien invaders that had provided the technology for the capsules and wanted to take over the world. The Red Ribbon Army would save the world. The androids were the future. The adventure continues. After Frieza returned to Earth to exterminate the Saiyans, the Super Saiyan legend was finally fulfilled. Raditz, Bardock, and Goku were able to defeat Frieza and his forces. Now the Earth knows of the existence of the Saiyans, some even seeing them as heroes. After all, the whole world saw the invasion of the Frieza Force. It seemed like peace had finally returned, but behind the scenes, the malicious Dr. Jiro has begun to develop androids, as he believes he sees the truth. In this story, the Red Ribbon Army was never able to rise up in order to make Red's wish come true. During that time, King Vegeta was still in power. In the time of peace since the reveal of the Saiyans, that Red Ribbon Army has begun to theorize just what they could mean to the planet, coming to the conclusion that the Saiyans must have been the aliens to give Capsule Corp their technology. No doubt getting ready to take over the world. They can't let that happen. They have to be the ones to take over. Meanwhile, the Saiyans lived peaceful lives. The defeat of Frieza meant they were finally free, but soon felt power nearby similar to Frieza. Goku, Vegeta, Raditz, Bardock, King Vegeta, Piccolo, and the human fighters all turned up. They were surprised to see King Cold's ship arrive. Unlike the original manga, Frieza was never rescued and turned into a cyborg. King Cold stands alone in front of the Saiyans to obtain revenge. He was simply going to destroy their world, unless the king and the prince joined them. Vegeta laughed, saying that he isn't the one he wants. It's Goku and his family. But as he was going to give them a chance to retreat, King Vegeta stood tall, saying that Earth is now now under their protection. Bardock and the others were surprised at this. This was uncharacteristic of King Vegeta, but it looks like the battles and struggles against Frieza had begun to change him. As they were going to give him a chance to leave, something sliced clean through the body of King Cold, killing him. Everyone was in shock as they watched a young man pull his hair back and smile at them while destroying the spaceship. He began to approach them with a malicious grin. All of the Saiyans transformed into Super Saiyan, with Raditz commenting on how they couldn't even sense his key. Vegeta, who had 
trained his way into Super Saiyan pushed forward to attack. But something stood in his way. Another mysterious warrior, a Super Saiyan with a Capsule Corp jacket. He stops the being dead in his tracks, fighting to the point of cutting his scarf off. Bardock couldn't believe what he was seeing. He didn't realize that there were any other Saiyan survivors. However, King Vegeta broke out in a cold sweat. The battle intensified until the man with the cut bandana suddenly stopped. He had to get a new ascot. He just couldn't fight without his favorite piece of clothing. He promised to return, retreating rapidly. The Saiyan turned around and apologized for the strange introduction, but he had arrived with a warning. That warrior you saw kill King Cold, that was Android 17, one of the many androids created by the Red Ribbon Army. In my future, that android killed many of you, catching you by surprise. Goku perished soon due to a strange disease. A few years from now, the Red Ribbon Army took over the world and released an evil being even greater than Android 17. My mother believed that if you all had survived, we would all be safe. The android I fought is a lot stronger than he seems, but I was trained by two of you. Gohan and Raditz. I'm stronger than all of you now, but my strength doesn't come close to that evil monster we've been fighting off. Vegeta didn't believe a word the future warrior was saying, though he was more interested in Goku as he pulled him to the side, finally explaining that, depending how things go, he may have to return and check on how things are doing. Hopefully, this one change will ripple through the future into his own timeline. He provided Goku with the heart medicine. Goku passed away from the heart virus in the future, a virus many of the other Saiyans also got. Thankfully, Bulma and the scientists were able to cure it not long after Goku passed. Even so, it left the older Saiyans weaker than they otherwise would have been. Trunks goes on to explain that they don't know much about the monster that destroyed their world, but they do have a single name, Cell. Trunks stayed in the past for a little while after that, and actually trained with the rest of the warriors for a few months, making sure that they make the right amount of progress as well as telling them all about the information he has on the androids. He reveals that some of the androids disappeared after Cell showed up, however, he has no idea what happened to them. Despite this, a lot of the androids remained. It seemed like a lot of the Red Ribbon Army had been turned into cyborgs themselves. Vegeta's family was especially insistent on training with a future warrior. They didn't know his name but he was stronger than all of them? Hell yeah, they wanted to train with him. Goku and his family were the ones to turn Super Saiyan first, but if there's anything beyond it, then Vegeta and his family will be. Despite this, Trunks was apprehensive about this. If something went wrong, perhaps he wouldn't be born. He had to be careful with whom he interacted. Still, the situation was extremely dire. If he could help them get stronger and save his world, then he would have to do it. Bardog really liked the kid. It's clear that he has a lot of spirit and specifically thanked him for protecting the world he had been living in, a planet that became his home. He said he was trained by Gohan and Raditz, then he too was part of Bardock's family legacy. He was one of them. Trunks blushed at the idea, realizing that he really was the union of the two Saiyan families left in a single being, representing both humanity and Saiyanhood. Still, the day came where Trunks had to leave, but did make sure that Goku had at least started to take his medicine. This Trunks is more careful. He has a lot more people that rely on him, beyond just future future Gohan and future Bulma. Everyone did notice just how awkward Trunks was around the king and the prince. He wanted to learn a lot about them and about the old Saiyan race. The prince had no interest in talking to him about anything except for training. The king was more open though, and he explained just how luscious and beautiful the planet was before it was decimated by Frieza. How rich of a history they had. Planet Sadala, their old armors, even the many planets they conquered. He talked about it with a lot of pride. Trunks was disgusted by their actions, but realized that they too were victims. They died at the hands of an emperor. Trunks realized that the way Vegeta communicated his emotions was through fighting. So in a way, he got to learn a lot more about him with that. Meanwhile, at the lab, Dr. Jiro had scolded Android 17 for having approached the Saiyans so early on. He wasn't ready yet, but 17 and 18 argued that he just wanted to have fun and not be cooped up here the entire time. In the future timeline, he killed the majority of the humans, leaving the Saiyans lamenting their deaths. Trunks and his family, having lived through that, told him that if there's any chance that he could potentially change the future and have them be included in it, then it'd be worth it. It was risky, he didn't want to change too many things, but the humans represented more to them than the rest of the entire world. Gine was still working on her catering business, with encouragement from Chi Chi. Both she and Gine became business partners, as they cater many parties and events with dazzling speed and gaining glowing reviews. 
During the three years, the Warriors also continued to explore the world, but they were inspired to do so by something Trunks said. After Cell and the androids attacked, the Saiyans got largely the blame. Humanity at large blamed Saiyans for what had become of them. So the Saiyans took it upon themselves to actually do something with that fame, going to various places around the world and showing them whatever little bit of kindness they could. For example, there was a village in the desert to which they brought water. During this time, Bardock focuses on training little Gohan. He's getting quite powerful and wants him to be the future protector of Earth. He is their family legacy after all, and if he was the one to train Trunks, then obviously Bardock ends up doing a very good job. Vegeta had unlocked Super Saiyan prior to the arrival of Trunks, thanks to constant training against Goku inside of the hyperbolic time chamber. They don't like going there a lot, it's very hard on them, mentally and physically, but it was that exact mental strain that Vegeta needed to push him into Super Saiyan. Now King Vegeta was the only one left without it. It seems like he kept getting close over and over again, but as the oldest of the Saiyans, it also seems like he couldn't quite take it. Vegeta and Goku wouldn't give up though, there were sparks of it, moments where he kept it up for a few minutes, but it would never last. Perhaps in their next battle, he would be able to do it. When the fateful day arrived, all of the warriors made their way to the island. Bulma has a little baby with her. His name is Trunks. This surprised everyone, except for Goku, just like in the original story. Soon, there was a small explosion, forcing the warriors to go down and investigate. Once they arrive on the site, it's covered by smoke. They know they cannot sense the android's key, as Trunks had told them beforehand, as key blasts shoot from all directions, causing explosions all around. But where is it originating from? They hear people screaming and crying from the smoke, until finally, a glowing evil set of red eyes appear. Bardock gets tired of this game as the smoke continues to wallow around them, and the eyes start back and forth. Bardock gets tired of this game, expands his aura, and dissipates the smoke once and for all, only to reveal a little floating robot looking directly at them. What the hell? Bardock says, only to hear his voice echo behind them, but louder. They turn around to see a screen on a building showing all of them. The little robots are cameras. Everyone is watching as it's being broadcast around the world. As you can see, these aliens you saw as heroes are no more than invaders. They have attacked this city. Look at all the flames and the hurt people surrounding them. The evidence is clear. Do what you will with it. Goku's eyes widened as he looks to the side, seeing people running and fleeing. Where the hell are you? We didn't do this. It was the blasted Red Ribbon Army. That's when finally two androids descended from the sky, sporting that Red Ribbon Army logo. One is a blue-eyed, blonde-haired man in uniform. The other, a ninja in purple. The voice from the screen says, The Red Ribbon Army has come to your aid to protect you from these evil invaders. Of course, we know them as General Blue and Murasaki. They quickly burst towards Vegeta and Goku, while Bardock yells at them to get it away from the city, as well as for the humans to help the civilians. King Vegeta wonders if revealing themselves was worth this humiliation. The Saiyans are doing very well against these androids, clearly weaker than the ones Trunks had warned about. But as the fight continues, Vegeta and Goku realize that they're wasting too much stamina. Vegeta fires a blast at the blonde one from behind, who turns around and instantly absorbs it with his palm. As he thought, Trunks had warned them about some androids capable of actually absorbing absorbing key. Goku and Vegeta realize what they need to do, rushing in together and punching through the ninja, making sure that he has no chance to absorb any more of their power. Murasaki is sent through a building as it collapses on itself. Blue realizes that he's in trouble. He has to get away. King Vegeta says that they should kill him, but Bardock explains that if they follow him, they'll be able to find where he's going. They speed right behind General Blue following him through a force field, which, when inside, reveals a previously camouflaged base. The Z Fighters stopped dead in their tracks as they were met by glowing red eyes and arms pointed straight at them. It seemed like every single soldier in the Red Ribbon Army had been turned into an android. Several blasts flew past the Saiyans' heads as they dodged and weaved out of the way, but there were so many, they were bound to get hit by a few. So this was their plan, lure them out and kill them. Future Trunks arrived once again to support the heroes, just as he said he would. Future Trunks tried to sense everyone's power, and when he headed towards it, there was nothing. He wondered what the hell was going on, until he saw somebody down below. 
King Vegeta. He had drifted further away from battle, having crashed through the force field and outside of the battleground. Future Trunks landed to help his grandfather. King Vegeta hadn't seen him since he left, but as soon as he laid eyes on him, he recognized him. It was the future warrior, but there was something familiar about him. Having now seen the little Trunks, slowly things began to come into place. King Vegeta told his grandson that his information had been useful during the match, but he fears the worst is yet to come. They have only seen two androids so far. Together, they cross the barrier and into the carnage. So, this is where the androids had come from. Some of them, Trunks recognized from the future. In his timeline, this area was completely desolated. Now, it all started to make sense. The war continued, as Trunks joined in and slides through as many androids as he could. They weren't the strongest, but in mass, they were definitely a problem. From inside the base, Red and Black stood tall watching the battles. It was so back and forth that they weren't sure who would win, turning to Dr. Jiro and asking him if it's time to release the rest. Jiro nodded reassuring his commanders that he has been working hard for the last three years to ensure his problem projects will always be on their best behavior. Jiro motions to a tall man standing behind him. The doctor smiles at him, telling him, Good luck, son. Two others stood next to him, cracking their knuckles. Three figures crashed down in front of Bardock and Gohan, causing a huge wave of wind that destroyed some androids. The Saiyans recognized one of them, Android 17, who had previously attacked them. Trunks yelled out from behind, That's them! Android 16, 17, and 18! Everyone turned back to look at him, with Kakarot waving at him happily. Jiro and the commanders were surprised to see that this kid knew who they were. They all stood together, charging up to the max, and rushing forward. But despite their best efforts, Android 16 was a wall no one could get past. Bardock and Goku battled 17, King Vegeta and Vegeta battled 18, while Trunks, Gohan, and Raditz battled 16. Bardock complimented 17. Despite being so young, he was an excellent martial artist, yet 17 was wasn't nearly as cocky or talkative compared to his first encounter with the heroes. He is completely focused on completing his mission. It appears that Jiro's reprogramming of 17 and 18 was a success. 18 had no mercy for the cocky prince. She has a more playful personality than 17, but she is still focused on completing her mission. Gohan realizes that 16 has been very careful about keeping the battles within the confines of the HQ, with Gohan asking him why. 16 cocks an eyebrow, replying by saying that he is here to protect the world, plants, and animals, which the aliens have been trying to take over. Gohan argues that he wants the same thing, but 16 is having none of it. However, a stray blast heading towards a set of dinosaurs, which Gohan reflects, makes 16 wonder how true that actually is. Regardless, he isn't going to risk the world's safety. 16 fires a huge blast at Raditz and Gohan, which Trunks steps in the way of and cuts in half with a sword, nearly melting it in the process. They had to retreat, they just knew it. Piccolo asks, Strunks what the hell they're going to do as swarms of more androids approach. King Vegeta puffed his chest, telling everyone that he will take care of it. The rest will have to escape. Vegeta tries to argue with him. He can't do that. They need him if they are to win the war. Trunks agrees, even if Vegeta tells him to stay out of this. This is a family matter. Bardock tells them that they don't have time for this. They have to make a choice now. Trunks slices his sword in front of him, molted pieces of his sword splashing all over some of the androids, keeping them at bay for just a second as King Vegeta puts a hand on his son's shoulder. Take care of our family. Be better than I've been. Save your future. Vegeta's heart sank as he watched his father zoom towards the androids. He was going to follow him. He wasn't going to let him do this alone, but Trunks grabbed onto him. They made it out through an opening in the shield. There's too many of you for me to take on, but I know one way to defeat you. This shield will contain my power and leave the rest of Earth intact. You have lost. This is all of my Saiyan pride, and the pride humanity has given me. The various androids began to fire blasts at King Vegeta, but he continued to build up more and more ki. Dr. Jiro yelled at them to stop him. As more blasts came his way, King Vegeta had to take a knee. He couldn't stand up, he couldn't move, but as 16 jumped over him to try to cover everyone, the king smirked. A giant, blazing light appearing over him. Vegeta just barely managed to turn around and see what was happening. To him, for a second, it looked like the Saiyan royal symbol appearing before exploding. The giant key blaze covered the entire arena as the opening the heroes had arrived through has part of the explosion escaped through it. Parts of androids scattered all over, but from the rubble, as King Vegeta's cape waved in the wind, 16, 17, and 18 rose.
Seventeen mocked the king, ripping part of the cape off and replacing his own burnt-off bandana around his neck, part of the royal symbol still visible on it. Red yells over at Jero, saying that his androids should have killed them. If they can't do it, then they should release their ultimate weapon. Jero refuses, saying that it's too early. Meanwhile, the Z fighters make their way to Kami's lookout. They can no longer feel King Vegeta's key. Vegeta's silent. The androids return to Red and Jero. Sixteen apologizes, and later asks Jero in private if they really are doing the right thing. The doctor insists that they are. It has to be. Otherwise, he wouldn't have risked turning his own son into a cyborg. Goku tries to console Vegeta about this, but he is having none of it. He slaps Goku's hand away when he tries to talk to him. Vegeta tries to play it off as if he doesn't care, but it's clear to everyone that it does bother him. That's when Kami mentions something. The hyperbolic time chamber. The same chamber they used not long ago in order to train against Frieza. Bardock puts a hand on the prince's shoulder and starts walking towards the chamber. Vegeta tells him to unhand him, but Bardock doesn't let go. He just keeps dragging him into the time chamber, throwing him inside. The door locks behind them. A fight erupts. The two Super Saiyans clash in such an incredible manner, but it's clear that Vegeta needed to let it all out. It was impressive. Bardock had never seen Vegeta so angry, so powerful before. Bardo continued to tell him that his father was proud of him, that he did what he could to protect his family, that now it's his turn to do the same. Vegeta understands that. Don't you get it, Prince? Your father did this for you! I fear something even worse is coming. Are you gonna let that stupid elite sacrifice be in vain? Vegeta looked at the palms of his hand. He was angry to hear someone talk that way about his father, about his royal lineage. The two spent a few months inside the chamber before coming out, but stronger than ever before. With that understanding, the Saiyans begin to enter the chamber. Goku with Gohan, Bardock with Raditz, and Vegeta with Trunks. Each one has a little less time in the chamber, since there's more people, and the situation is dire, spending half a year inside instead of a full one. While in there, it becomes clear to Vegeta that Trunks is in fact his future son. He realizes that they both have a dog in this fight. Meanwhile, Piccolo insists that they can't leave the world alone while they train. Krillin and the others agree, but they don't have much of a choice. Piccolo has felt a strange energy. They all wonder what this could be. Trunks, who was waiting for his turn in the time chamber, stands up, shaking in fear, recognizing that power. That was Cell. They could feel each other's key within that being. Trunks wants to go right away, but the others agree he's not strong enough. None of them are. Plus, he will be more valuable if he goes inside the time chamber and trains with Vegeta. They can't have him dying. Piccolo instead insists on fusing with Kami. Kami argues that this is risky. They won't have the Dragon Balls. Vegeta brings up the idea of going to Nam. Perhaps they have more Dragon Balls there. Kami acknowledges that this is a good idea. Thus, Kami and Piccolo agree to fuse. The massive power surge is incredible. It actually angers Vegeta. They all wonder if they'll even need to go inside the chamber anymore. Could Piccolo do this alone? Without saying another word, Piccolo leaves. He heads back to the site of the Red Ribbon Army base, sneaking through as he hides his power level. What little soldiers are left gather in with Red, who announces to the world that the Red Ribbon Army has arrived in order to rid the universe of these aliens who are trying to destroy the world. They are building a defense force that will no doubt stop any invader from ever returning. An armor around the world only known as Cell. This is the monster that destroyed the future. That must be the power they felt. The androids are still looking for the Saiyans through the world, stopping at Goku's home, where they simply ignore Chi Chi and ransack the house. Chi Chi tries to put up a fight. Android 18 says she understands why Goku married such a woman, simply slapping her out of the way. Kame House doesn't fare much better either. The androids had just returned and explained to Dr. Jiro that they couldn't find Goku anywhere. At least, none of his known locations. Piccolo sighs in relief, realizing that they have no idea about the location of Kami's lookout. With that acknowledgement, and having seen Cell for the first time, he tries to sneak out. He is seen by Android 17. Hey, you, where's the bathroom? In that moment of terror, Piccolo blasts 17 while trying to escape, their battle instantly erupting. Piccolo tries to escape as fast as he can, with Jiro yelling at them to stop him. If he was here, then he knows where the rest of the Saiyans are. Piccolo wasted no time and launched the first attack, sending a flurry of energy blast towards 17. 17 deflected each attack effortlessly with a smirk, a smirk which seemed to grow wider with each passing moment. He began to dodge and counter his movements fluid and precise. At first, he had taken the fight seriously, doing nothing but what he was ordered. But now, a mischievous glint 
appeared in his eyes. He seemed to be having a little bit of fun as he playfully taunted Piccolo. Watching from afar, 18 exchanged a puzzled glance with 16. 17's personality fighting back against the reprogramming? Not long after, Vegeta and Trunks arrive, and they have a huge advantage. Gohan had spoken to Trunks prior to the chamber and tells him that he doesn't think the androids are bad people. They're misguided. They were kidnapped and changed. A lot of the army was. Did they all have a choice? The red guy and Jiro had brainwashed them. Trunks argued with Gohan, telling him that he's sure. These androids destroyed his future. He doesn't care if they were once good people. They are evil now. But Gohan's words continue to echo in his mind as he gets ready to fight against 16 and Vegeta against 18. Trunks argues with 16 that if he wants to save the planet, then he will stop Jiro from releasing Cell, as in his future, he is the reason the world is in ruin. That future represents a world where the skies are covered in a forever green dusk and plants rarely grow. 16 is very much affected by this. It's clear that 18 is losing, and 17 is close to losing too. Red yells at Jiro that it's over. Jiro argues that it's too dangerous, so he pushes Red out of the way and yells on the mic at the androids to retreat back to the base. The androids want to keep fighting, but 16 tells them that it's not worth it. They can't save the world if they're all dead. This resounds with Trunks. It's basically the same thing that he got told prior to entering the chamber. 16 continues to say that he not only needs to protect the world, but the two of them as his family. Android 16 proceeds to use the Hell Flash to keep them all away retreating alongside the androids. Lava spreads everywhere as Vegeta wants to go after them, but Piccolo and Trunks stop him, telling him that Cell may appear soon, and he's even stronger than any of them. Jiro had said that the bio-android was not ready yet. Meanwhile, Goku and Gohan exit the time chamber as full-on Super Saiyans. Raditz and Bardock enter soon after. Goku and Gohan go to their home, where they find a scared Chi-Chi. Goku hugs her and takes her to Grandpa Gohan's home. Bardock and Gine live close by. Gine promises to take care of her until it all blows over. Meanwhile, at Red's HQ, Jiro talks to the androids about their next move. 17 and 18 are starting to openly question Jiro once again about their motives and the Red Ribbon Army. Jiro realizes that their reprogramming was starting to falter. Those fights must have affected. He decides that rather than allow them to break free from the reprogramming and rebel, he'll go with his backup plan. Jiro tells his androids not to worry. They have a secret weapon that will eliminate their enemies once and for all. A pod opens from behind 17 and 18. To red eyes glowing. 17 and 18 are visibly afraid as footsteps inch closer to them and 16 steps in the way trying to stop him. Jiro says that there was no other way. 16 doesn't care. He's willing to die for his family. But Cell slaps him out of the way with his tail. Jiro admits to himself that he doesn't want to destroy his son instead pressing a different button electrocuting 17 and 18. They were screaming out. Over the course of the years after 17 tried to do something without his permission, he developed many techniques to stop them from doing what they want. The first one was reprogramming them, but if that failed, electrocuting them and torturing them was the best next step. Cell absorbed them both. My family. My brother and sister. I am now perfect. Sixteen asks why he had to do this, but Jiro kneels down next to him, saying that the only family they have left is each other. 16 looks at Jiro, but then his eyes move over to look at Cell. He was including Cell into this family. Huh. On the news, Red announces that, with Cell behind him, some of the invaders were still out there, and that he requests their presence at a new match. It was time to end things. Thanks to the support of the public and the King of Earth, the Cell games in this universe take place in the World Tournament Arena. After some more training, Bardock comes out of the chamber with Raditz, and instantly feels the key of Cell. They don't stand a chance. But he looks at Gohan and Trunks. Maybe they do. The team takes this time to enjoy their company. Gine and Bulma insisted on having a nice meal as a family. After all, Trunks had never really had that. And it was wonderful. The day arrived. Cell and 16 are the only fighters around. No one is at the martial arts tournament. At least they knew not to bring the public in there. It was just being televised. Cell stands in the middle, staring down at the fighters. People from all over the world boo the Saiyans. As Cell says that it's finally time to save the world from these evildoers. This Cell is stronger than the one in the original story. After all, he has Cells from many, many Super Saiyans who have been around for as long as Goku has. The Z fighters are set in place 
Bees, Bardock, Raditz, Gohan, Trunks, Goku, Vegeta, Piccolo, Krillin, even Tien, Chi Chi, and Gine are there. But there's too many of them, and it wouldn't be fun to just have a 1v1 every time. Cell births the Cell Juniors. The terrifying beings scare the Z Fighters, with Krillin gulping. Then he realizes something. Where's 18 and 17? Bardock asks this exact question to Cell, who just laughs. He explains that he wouldn't have been able to achieve this perfect form if it wasn't for them. They all stay quiet. In unison, they had come to the same conclusion. 17 and 18 weren't like the other androids. It was clear that they were rebellious, that they didn't want to fight for Jiro. Something was going on here. They were just lambs to the slaughter. Krillin is the first one to burst forward, showing just how brave he is, even if the Cell Jr. simply slaps him away. This causes all the Saiyans to transform into Super Saiyans, as Bardock pushes himself forward, leading the charge. While fighting, Bardock tells Cell that he liked the one with the scarf, or the bandana, or whatever. Cell laughs, saying that technically, they're all fighting together. 16 curses under his breath, something which Jiro takes a note of. The battle raged on, with an intensity that shook the very earth beneath them. Gohan and Trunks match their intensity, their energy levels skyrocketing as they push to their limits, focusing on Android 16. Meanwhile, Goku and Vegeta, both in their Super Saiyan forms, engaged in the fierce battle against Cell, his body constantly adapting and evolving to counter their attacks. Piccolo and Krillin work together to take on the Cell Juniors as well, trying to buy time for the Saiyans to finish off their main foe. Tien, Yamcha, Chi Chi, and Gine stood alongside them too. They fire their various blasts, but Cell Juniors' overwhelming strength began to take a toll. Amidst the chaos, Android 16 stood hesitantly on the sidelines. His eternal programming conflicting with his desires to do what he believed was right, he missed 17 and 18. But he turned back to look at Jiro. He knew he had to keep fighting. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, Cell's sinister grin widened as he launched a devastating energy blast aimed directly at Bardock, hoping that killing their patriarch would prompt the Saiyans to go even further. But their attempts to reach Bardock in time were futile, only to hear somebody blast from the sidelines. A beam came crashing down, stopping Cell's blast. It was Gohan. Kakarot looked at him proudly as did Raditz and the rest of the fighters. Goku's role is replaced with Gohan, as Goku is pushed to the side and 16 is forced to fight him. Red is Jovius. They really don't stand a chance. Maybe they don't need the Dragon Balls after all. Perhaps he can really just wish to be taller. Juro and Black look at him confused, but Red continued to talk about how he wanted to be taller, that once the world was saved, he'd rule it by just being the tallest one. Black and Juro's face dropped. They couldn't believe they were hearing this. They had bigger plans than that. I've had enough of your nonsense. If you won't support my wishes, then I'll- Dr. Jiro's patience wore thin. With a cold, calculating expression, he reached out and grabbed Commander Red by the collar, lifting him off of his feet. If you won't stay focused on our objectives, then you're of no use to us. With a swift, merciless motion, Jiro hurled Red over the balcony's edge and directly into the path of a powerful energy blast that Bardock had fired at Cell, who was fighting nearby. Red's screams were drowned out by the explosion. Black couldn't believe that Jiro did that. Bardock curses. Even these humans were betraying each other left and right. They were more similar to Saiyans in that way. Sixteen thinks back to what Trunks said to him before, and watches as Trunks continues to get pummeled over and over by a Cell Jr. Was Cell the one responsible for the death of their planet? As Goku's about to punch him in the face once more, Sixteen stops the fight, telling him that now he realizes who the real villains are. Sixteen wipes some blood from his face, as Goku realizes that he's not fully mechanical, is he? In fact, he really was Dr. Jiro's son turned into a cyborg by his father. The terrified Black points a gun at Jiro, but Jiro hears the sound of the gun cocking. The sound of it echoes in the battlefield, as 16 turns back to look at his father. But Jiro slowly stands up, revealing his brain in a casing. He too is an android. Jiro picks up Black by the neck and crushes it. Don't worry, my son. Just finish them off, and this planet is ours. Go support your android sibling. Sixteen eyes shake. Android sibling? He had two siblings. And this Cell guy wasn't one of them. I'm sorry, father, but I must stop him. Jiro's twisted smile turns, his piercing eyes looking at Sixteen as he exclaimed, I was talking to Cell. His father truly was lost, consumed by madness, greed, and revenge. Bardock, fueled by his desire to protect the future of his Saiyan lineage, leaped in front of Gohan, embracing him tightly to shield him from the impending blast. Yet, the attack never reached them, as Android 16 had positioned himself in front of Cell, acting as a shield for Gohan and Bardock. 
and Droid 16 knew he no longer was seen as a son. He wouldn't allow another father to lose his. Cell rushed their way, but 16 jumped at him, grasping Cell firmly. With resolve in his voice, he spoke to the planet, seeking forgiveness for what he had done and what he was about to do. This may hurt the world. A brilliant explosion erupted as Android 16 self-destructed. Barda grabbed onto his wife and flew away. Kakarot did the same thing, while Gohan, Trunks, Vegeta, and the others grabbed whoever they could. But the World Tournament Arena was completely annihilated. Meanwhile, the civilians in the Dragon World were watching. They had seen the death of Red and wondered if he was one of the bad guys too. This was too confusing. The island was destroyed. The cameras no longer worked. Public perception began to change. Even if they were aliens, that cell guy was fighting an 11 year old. And there was a lot of talk about taking over the world. They didn't talk about it like they were saviors, but rulers. Even without the camera feed, people started to cheer for the Saiyans. The Saiyans descended again to see if 16 had survived as Gohan stepped on something on accident. It was a chip, tears falling from his eyes and onto it. Cell Juniors laid around, defeated, but soon they felt an incredible energy. They turned around to see that over time Cell began to regenerate, but without warning, without saying anything, Vegeta jumped ahead, bursting forward, protecting everyone. This was uncharacteristic of the prince, but something had stirred in him ever since King Vegeta's death. It was clear he wanted to protect not only his son, but the Saiyan race that still lived on. Everyone was inspired by this display. Bardock was particularly proud. This was almost sensory overlord for the kids. While looking at the piece of Android 16 in his hand, both Gohan and Trunks exploded in rage, an electrifying current washing over them. As Goku and Vegeta did what they could, sensing them but not turning back, they couldn't get their eyes off of Cell. They had to do what they could. Amid the chaos, Dr. Jero's cries pierced the air. His son had chosen that path of self-destruction, leaving him in despair as he questioned the purpose of his actions. But Bardock landed by him. The Saiyan Patriarch approached him with an unexpected act of compassion. No one should suffer the loss of a child. Bardock looked overhead, looking at Raditz, Kakarot. They were fighting however they could, even in their weakened state. They had to protect their family. That was something Jiro lost long ago, when he sacrificed his son to create a monster. As Bardock said this, a death beam shot right through Dr. Jiro and then through Bardock. Jiro could barely turn around to look at Cell and ask why, as the android explained that he had a clean shot to Bardock. He had to take it. Raditz falls to his knees before trying to get to his father, while Goku and Vegeta stay quiet. It was all too much for the hybrid Saiyans. Gohan, his grandfather, King Vegeta, Android 16, they had all died for him. In one way or the other, his family, people he gotten close to, friends. For Trunks, it was quite similar. Bardock had treated him as part of the family before he even knew who he was. And after all, Trunks felt like he was his legacy too. Alongside Gohan, Trunks' aura exploded into bits of electricity, their hair spiking up even more, ascending to a level beyond Super Saiyan. Raditz ran over to Bardock, holding his hand. He was still alive, but barely. In that last moment, the last remaining Cell Jr. appeared over Raditz. Gohan appeared in front of him and smashed his fist against him, exploding the Cell Jr. Raditz stays by his father, telling him to stay alive, to stay with him. But slowly, his vital signs were going. Cell knows that this is the end of the battle, charging up one final Kamehameha. He launches the beam, but neither Trunks nor Gohan are going to give up just yet. Trunks, having been trained by Raditz in the future, fires a double sun Day, while Gohan, who had trained for many years alongside Piccolo, fires a powerful Masenko. Chi Chi and Gine yell out for their sons. They are the first ones to fire their own attacks. Though it doesn't do much, it does add to the blast. Cell still laughs, saying that it won't be enough to stop him, that the dream of the Red Ribbon Army shall be accomplished. The humans fire their own attacks, followed by Vegeta and Kakarot. They had to help their sons. Piccolo launches a special beam cannon, adding even further to the attack. But as Bardock's hand and falls to the floor, his spirit leaving for other world. Raditz's tears begin to steam off of his own face, the heat of his aura expanding. He turns back to look at Cell and says to him, You were his creation, and you didn't even react when he died. His death was for nothing, and I'll make sure yours is too. Raditz bursts into Super Saiyan, joining in the blast. Remembering his father, the times he fought against him, the times they fought together, Vegeta too thought similarly. Remembering King Vegeta, 
Redis is blessed, united with the rest, as it finally pushed forward against Cell, consuming him completely. As Cell dies, he hears Dr. Jerome's voice in his mind one last time. The first time he talked to him, long ago, when he was still in his incubator, when he called him perfect. There were many losses, but it was finally over. With no more Dragon Balls on Earth, the Z Fighters now must go to Namek and find a new set of Dragon Balls, along with a new Guardian. Popo himself suggested that Kami often talked about memories he couldn't quite make out. This, however, did lead them to Kami's spaceship. They also had the Saiyan spaceships, of course, which Dr. Briefs used as inspiration. Grandpa Gohan and Master Roshi were extremely proud of everyone and happy to see them safe, though lamenting the losses. Gine grieved for her husband, but knowing that he will come back, the Z Fighters leave for Namek, with Piccolo continuing to train Gohan and trunks in their new form, while Goku and Vegeta fought each other, trying to achieve it. Raditz was there too, helping Piccolo train the boys whenever he could. The Z Fighters arrive on Namek, meeting everyone. After they explained what they were there for, they were quickly trusted, especially sensing Piccolo, who had Kami within him and had good intentions. They chose Dende as the Guardian of Earth, with the kid knowing how heavy of a role this was, but glad to help a planet out there finding his calling, especially since this Piccolo guy reminded him a lot of Nail. They stayed on Namek for a while, before returning to Earth, restoring the Dragon Balls and Earth to how it used to be, reviving those who were killed, King Vegeta, Bardock, 17, 18, and 16. Gohan quickly met with 16, telling him that he was sorry about what happened, and that Jiro hadn't come back. He lost his humanity, and turned himself purely into an android. I am saddened by his passing, but I fear this was the only way to stop this madness. And if Capsule Corp may help me, I would like for me and my siblings to be freed of our programming so we can live peaceful lives. Bulma is more than happy to help, though she is terrified of 17 and 18, who are still jerks. It's a tearful reunion with the Elder Saiyans, Bardock and King Vegeta, with Trunks and Gohan tearfully hugging their grandparents, joking with them and telling him that Super Saiyan 2 is their next step, thanks to Gohan and Trunks. That's when Gine finally saw Bardock and ran to his arms, telling him to never leave her again. Bardock laughed before kissing her. King Vegeta was unsure what the Super Saiyan 2 was and told Gohan and Trunks to show it off. They happily obliged, as King Vegeta was completely dumbfounded by that power. King Vegeta and Bardock looked at each other, smirking and saying that they too shall achieve that form. Vegeta, Goku, and Raditz interject, saying that if anybody's going to go even further beyond, it's gonna be them. Thus, the threat of the androids has been defeated. Trunks is set to return to his timeline, find that Cell guy, and defeat him once and for all. The goodbye is bittersweet, and so peace returns to the world. But as soon as they return to their homes, Bardock finds that his little dojo which he has built by Grandpa Gohan's home is completely filled. People from all over the world have been asking him to train. It's clear that the public perception of the Saiyans has slowly started to turn again. At the forefront, 17 and 18. Bardock had commented on how much he liked the fighting style 17 showed off. Now they were here to train under him. While Vegeta and Bulma make an announcement on the news. Yes, Saiyans are real, they are aliens, but they're not here to hurt anyone. They're here to protect, to live peaceful lives just as anyone would. Because now they're not just Saiyans, they're Earthlings too. Seven years have gone by since the defeat of Cell. King Vegeta and Bardock have taken it upon themselves to take care of the androids and train them. Though originally they wanted to live at Capsule Corp, the androids instead decided to live on a remote island. Taking a bit of inspiration from Master Roshi, they wanted to live close to the animals and take care of the Earth, making a little farm for themselves. King Vegeta is a much more harsh instructor than Bardock ever was, though Bardock doesn't pull his punches either. Grandpa Gohan and Master Roshi often like to visit the dojo, they had to admit it, the Saiyan grandparents were fantastic instructors, even if they disagreed with a lot of their methods. There were a few times where Master Roshi had to step in and explain some of the fundamentals of training. Eat well, sleep well, train well, the turtle school way. King Vegeta thought this was ridiculous, but Bardock got it a little bit more. This caused a battle between the two, with Gine and the rest of the families simply face bombing. Those two often clashed heads. During the seven years of training, they were finally able to unlock 
Block Super Saiyan 2, though it was extremely difficult for King Vegeta in particular. He had been behind the other Saiyans for a while, but it looked like he was finally catching up. Raditz, meanwhile, lives at Kami's lookout alongside Dende, as he enjoys being a little bit more isolated. The Saiyans have all but disappeared from the public eye following the Cell attack. The TV signal had cut off soon after the battles began, but the public perception on the Saiyans began to turn, especially once Bulma and Vegeta made an announcement that the Saiyans were here to live peacefully. A martial artist named Mr. Satan had actually claimed to have defeated the Red Ribbon Army and the Saiyans. Most of the Saiyans didn't really like being celebrities, except for one. The Raditz likes to live in isolation, he would often go down to the surface of Earth and show off some of his skills. In fact, he entered a box tournament, becoming quite popular in that circle as well. Bardock heavily disapproved of this, but Gine thought it was kinda cute. Gine's catering business has grown considerably, as she has Chi Chi and even the Ox King working together with her. Gine and Chi Chi have a loyal staff of chefs, which they've trained themselves. Gine is the face of the company, so she's also one of the Saiyans who've sort of embraced that celebrity culture, even if not to the same degree as her son. Goku and Vegeta often train together, retaining that bitter rivalry and obtaining Super Saiyan two together. They slowly seem to get closer to unlocking a power even further beyond. Thanks to Chi Chi's influence, Gohan does enter school. King Vegeta gets close to Gohan, saying that the education system on planet Vegeta was actually quite refined thanks to Frieza. But low-class Saiyans never really cared for education, did they? Gohan kept up training a lot more than in canon, and getting stronger than he was before. During those seven years, Kakarot and Chi-Chi have a second son. They wonder what to name him, and Bardock makes a suggestion. He had an old friend back on planet Vegeta, a powerful warrior who sadly met his end far too early. His name was Tora, a traditional Saiyan name. Chi-Chi hadn't thought of that before, but agreed. Thus, Chi-Chi and Kakarot's second son is named Tora. But so we can tell the story easier, I'll continue to call him Goten, so nobody gets confused here. Once Gohan entered school, there was a girl there named Videl. She was the daughter of Mr. Satan. He was widely known as being the world martial arts champion. He argued that the Saiyans were still a threat as well. Most people ignored him on that regard. That was a widely unpopular opinion. Videl didn't recognize Gohan. It had been many years since his televised appearance, but there was something off about him, and Videl recognized that. This Gohan is much less timid than the one in the original story. In fact, he's a little bit of a showboat. He knows how strong he is, and he knows his family is a little bit famous. He openly flirts with Ereza, which doesn't sit well with Videl at all. She has made the same judgment calls about the Saiyans as her father has, but over the course of the semester, her and Gohan have no option but to get along. In order to prove to Gohan that the Saiyans aren't all that, she trains harder than ever before. And remember, this version of Mr. Satan actually fought against the army of King Vegeta long, long ago. This Mr. Satan has some knowledge of Ki, so him and Videl are actually stronger than in the original story. After an intense semester of training, she challenges Gohan to a fight. Gohan doesn't really want to hurt a girl. So, once all of the school gathers outside to watch this fight, and the teachers try to stop it, Gohan simply dodges out of the way of every single strike. Videl is infuriated, as she's actually defeated for the first time in her life. Videl actually thought that Gohan was going to destroy the school right then and there, alongside her, and she stood up to him, telling him that she's going to defend everyone right then and there. But Gohan didn't know what the hell she was talking about, and simply flew away. This surprised everyone, yet Gohan returned to school as if everything was normal the very next day. But Videl started to change her mind. She realized that if the Saiyan didn't kill her there, he probably wasn't trying to kill her at all. Clearly, the Saiyans being evil and defeated wasn't the entire truth. The two started to get along, even flirting a little, and Gohan was the one to invite her over to his house to train. Quote unquote. Still, the spunky girl threw a punch at Bardock, which he simply blocked with a smirk. That girl had a lot of spirit, and she was actually invited to train at the dojo alongside everyone else. That night, after Videl went back home, she asked Mr. Satan about it. Were the Saiyans truly evil? Did he actually try to defeat them? Mr. Satan said of course, they were just using a lot of tricks. As far as she knew, their ability to use Ki is unique to them. Remember, everyone got their memories erased after the battles against the Saiyans in the first part, so Mr. Satan actually thinks he's the only person in the world who can use Ki. But Videl realizes that this is a lie. She returns to Gohan and apologizes. She'd like to learn more from his family. Bardock steps into the room, once again welcoming her with open arms to his dojo. Goten, Videl, and Gohan become stronger thanks to Bardock's training. Goten and Trunks have explosive battles all the time. These hybrids have been raised around a lot more Saiyans, so their culture is much more instilled in them, including the savage battles they used to have. In fact, Chi-Chi and Bulma questioned if it was a good idea to allow their grandparents to 
tell them so much about the Saiyans, as one time they caught the kids acting out one of the planet conquerings. This is where our story picks up. The dojo of Bardock and King Vegeta stood tall, their trainees ranging from the young Saiyans Goten and Trunks to the advanced martial arts movements of Videl and Gohan. Not far from this scene, Grandpa Gohan, perched on his favorite rock, watched the proceedings with a nostalgic smile. Over the past few days, King Vegeta had observed two unfamiliar figures from a distance. These were Shin and Kibito. They stood like statues, their faces devoid of emotions, eyes fixed on the dojo's proceedings. Bardock decided to approach them, but as he drew nearer, something didn't feel right. Shin, catching Bardock's approach, stepped forward with greetings. We are but humble observers, intrigued by your training methods. You've been watching for days. What do you want? We mean you no harm, Kibito chimed in. We are here to learn. Before any conclusions could be drawn, two new challengers entered the scene, Yamu and Spopovich. Their grotesque appearance, especially the ominous M on their foreheads, drew instant attention. King Vegeta wanted to show the prowess of the dojo, welcoming them in, albeit with a hint of reluctance, especially after Grandpa Gohan whispered his concerns to Bardock about a dark aura emanating from them. When Spopovich arrogantly demanded to face King Vegeta himself, laughing off the audacity in their request, the Saiyan King offered to instead have him train with Trunks, a much more fitting opponent. Trunks said that he was going to go easy on him, putting one arm behind his back. However, Trunks shouldn't have underestimated his opponent. As the battle ensued, Spopovich's strength was surprising. A brutal assault left Trunks injured and enraged, instantly bursting into Super Saiyan to really show him what was up. It was clear that these weren't mere humans. Something had powered them up. Trunks was holding back way too much and ended up hurt. Seizing the moment of distraction, Spopovich and Yamu unveiled their treacherous intentions. As Yamu drained the young Saiyan's energy, Spopovich ambushed King Vegeta. The dojo erupted into chaos. Bardock rushed forward to attack Yamu, but as he got close, a nasty grin appeared right in front of him. Dabura, the Demon King appeared and spat at Bardock. The Saiyan barely heard Shin yell at him to take his glove off before he was fully encased in stone. King Vegeta and Gohan were both paralyzed, though Gohan did not get his energy stolen since he wasn't a Super Saiyan, unlike Trunks and Bardock. Once they collected the energy, Dabura, Spovich, and Yamu rushed away. Gohan, brimming with rage, threatened Shin, demanding an explanation. It's not what you think, there's a much greater threat at play here. Shin began to move to heal Trunks and King Vegeta, but Goten yelled at him to get away from them, actually firing a blast at Shin, which he stopped with one hand. Shin told them to listen. He's just going to heal them. What they just witnessed was the first move by Babidi, an evil wizard whose men seek to revive a monster named Majin Buu, a horror worse than anything they had ever faced before. King Vegeta nearly kills Shin as soon as he's healed, but Gohan gets him off of the Kaioshin. Shin is worried. King Vegeta is far too rageful. He could be dangerous to have around in this mission, but they have little choice. King Vegeta places a hand on his grandson's head, telling him that he's going to make those who did that to him suffer, but he should have kept his guard up. Trunks apologized. Grandpa Gohan interjected. Everyone, feel his key. This man means no harm to us. His intentions are pure. He's come seeking our help. Goten explained that he just wants his grandfather back. To do that, we must defeat Dabura. While Gohan smirked, cocky as ever. I've got this. No ancient sorcerer is a match for me. Shin, however, was skeptical. Gohan rolled his eyes, saying that he'll gather a team, while everybody else followed Yamu and Spopovich. Soon enough, Gohan had returned, with Raditz, Goku, Piccolo, and Prince Vegeta in tow. Gine had packed lunch for all of them. Trunks and Goten were to be taken care of by Videl, staying at the dojo to keep an eye on Bardock's statue. Kakarot and Raditz were angered by their father's fate. They made it to the site of Yamu and Spopovich. Dabura sensed them, lunging forward and aiming at Kibito. This, however, was intercepted by a raging King Vegeta. Their their fists clashed with intense energy, sending shockwaves that displaced the sand beneath their feet. Kakarot was observing from the sidelines, and whispered to Prince Vegeta, I've never seen him like this before. Vegeta narrowed his eyes, staying quiet. But Dabora expanded his key, quickly rising above the king and pushing him back. The king was furious, but Dabora managed to disappear back into the spaceship. They all followed suit. Piccolo was much more cautious than the others, siding with Shin and Kibito. They need to be careful, but the Saiyans quickly ignore that. Kakarot and Vegeta do rock, paper, scissors to see who fights Pui Pui, only for King Vegeta to blast him as soon as he appears. They move on to the next room. Goku keeps on looking at Vegeta in confusion, wondering what was up with King Vegeta, but they make quick work of Yakon as soon as they realize that he's absorbing their aura. King Vegeta wants to quickly move on to the next one, but something stops him. They all stare at the king. He starts to reel in pain, falling to his knees, as Babidi begins invading his mind. What had become of him? You see, unlike Vegeta in the original story, where he allowed himself to be taken over, King Vegeta is the opposite 
opposite. He's old, the oldest of them. He struggled to gain Super Saiyan, for example. His mind is weaker, and Babidi is taking advantage of that, and has been trying to invade his mind since earlier. Now King Vegeta can't fight back, as much as Vegeta and the rest yell at him to. King Vegeta looked up with a smirk, a dark M forming on his forehead. He had remembered what it felt like to take over planets, back before King Cold assigned Frieza to them, when he was free to do as he pleased. Earth had made him soft. Shin yelled at him to fight back, but the king snapped forward and kneed him in the face. Kibito saved Shin from another attack, being blasted in the process and killed. Shin wipes blood of his nose and tells them that the king is now merely a puppet of Bobbity. King Vegeta laughs and zoom backwards, no longer walking, just floating with his arms crossed, down to the next floor. They all stand there in disbelief. Vegeta understood to a degree. Suddenly, Vegeta fell to his knees. Seeing similar visions to the one King Vegeta, Piccolo and Goku ran to him though, putting their hands on his shoulders, reminding him of where they are now. Earth, Vegeta was much stronger than his father. He couldn't ever be just a simple puppet. Perhaps if he was that far behind from Kakarot, maybe he would have given in. But soon enough, he dispels Babidi from his mind. Piccolo speaks up, saying that he had spent a lot of time on Capsule Corp, alongside Vegeta, Bulma, King Vegeta, and his family. And it was clear that King Vegeta had changed over time, but the way he was fighting that day, it was different. Vegeta interjected, saying that he recognized those moves. He was no longer fighting to protect, he was fighting to conquer. As the heroes readied themselves for a battle against King Vegeta, they didn't want to hurt him. They made that clear. Asking King Vegeta if he could recall what they're here for, if he could fight against Bobbidi's mind control. By his side stood Dabora, but Vegeta didn't know how to approach his father. The two of them never had the best relationship, and he wasn't one to get emotional. If there was a way to get his father back, it was by beating him into it. Gohan and Raditz looked at each other, lunging towards Dabora as Vegeta and Goku rushed to King Vegeta. This was the chance Dabora had been waiting for. He could sense the anger behind every single one of the punches. Meanwhile, Goku and Vegeta engaged King Vegeta. Each strike, parry, and key blast, not just a physical exchange, but an emotional one for the prince. Babidi thought all this power was too sweet to go to waste. Sure, Vegeta managed to pull away from his mind control, but this Raditz guy, he was angry. Frustrated. Perhaps he would make a perfect puppet too. Whispering insidious words, preying on Raditz's insecurities, taunting him about always being overshadowed by his younger brother, Kakarot. The power which Babidi promised, the power which he could see on King Vegeta, was seductive. A dark M slowly being carved on his forehead. This forced Gohan to be the only one fighting Dabora. He could handle him alright, but he had to reach out to Raditz. And Gohan opened his aura firing a massive blast to Dabora and rushing down to Raditz. Uncle Raditz, listen to me. You're more than just a Saiyan, more than just your insecurities. Don't listen to him. Do you really want to end up a puppet like King Vegeta has? Dabora came rushing in, slamming Gohan to the ground right next to Raditz. It seemed like he was going to crush his head, but Gohan's eyes never drifted from his uncle. He kept on talking, shouting over at him, reminding him of everything they'd overcome together. How leaving planet Earth alongside Vegeta in order to defeat Frieza was one of the bravest things anyone had done. How he returned and warned everyone, trained hard alongside his brother and father. It was your bravery that helped us defeat Frieza and Cell. You're a hero to me. As the Dark M formed halfway through, Raditz began to stand up. Dabora laughed, telling Raditz to hurry up and attack alongside him. But the Saiyan found strength in Gohan's words. With a ground-shaking roar, energy erupted from him, electricity forming all around him, as it was once again covered in gold. Super Saiyan 2 had been reached. Dabora laughed, assuming that the power-up had come from Bobbidi, as Raditz grabbed him by the side of the head and slammed him against the wall. Together now, Gohan and Raditz, their power combined and spirits renewed, confronted the Demon King once more. He fired a barrage of spits, at the two Saiyans, which Gohan and Raditz avoided. They began to overwhelm the Demon King with a barrage of energy blasts. As Gohan continued to fire, Raditz rushed in through the middle of the barrage. Dabora had nowhere to run. Raditz moved his feet. It was almost as if he was dancing. In reality, he was putting his training to good use. His fists up, he began to throw quick jabs at the Demon King, avoiding every punch. Gohan had always thought his boxing career was really dumb. He was far too strong to be fighting anyone, and he had to hold back immensely. He really just did it for the attention, but at this moment he had to admit, it was impressive. Raditz yelled out Gohan's name as he finally threw the Demon King across the room and into a Masenko from Gohan, while from behind, Raditz unleashed his own double Sunday. The blast met in the middle, 
completely destroying the Demon King. Now all the attention was put on King Vegeta, as King Vegeta's blows were enhanced by Bobbity's magic and gave him an edge and speed he hadn't felt since he was young. His best years were far behind him, but now he remembered what it was like to conquer and he needed more. His strikes against his son were fierce, his anger evident with every powerful blow. It reminded him of training him back on planet Vegeta when he was young, but Vegeta countered each blow perfectly. Parry, deflected, looked for openings. The two of them blasted King Vegeta down. He was sent spinning right into Piccolo. Seeing this, he used his stretchy arms to try to grab King Vegeta and slam him to the ground. But the king sensed the incoming threat, spinning out of the way of his grasp, and with a powerful scream, he released a royal flash straight at Piccolo. The Namekian had no time to react, sending him crashing into a wall, momentarily out of the fight. Teleport us away! Take us to a city! Vegeta's eyes widened as the room around them disappeared and formed into his hometown. What was the king planning on doing here? A truck crashed, trying to avoid the people who appeared right in front of Capsule Corp. Piccolo, Gohan, and the Kaioshin immediately went out of their ways to save whoever they could, but King Vegeta immediately started firing indiscriminately around the place. Explosions and screams rang out everywhere as the city was engulfed by fire. But with the appearance of King Vegeta in the middle of West City, Z fighters from all around the world felt his presence. Mr. Satan had been following Vegeta in order to see just exactly what she was doing at those Saiyans dojo. He had been disappointed to find out that she had befriended one of them and had snuck in earlier that morning. He watched everything unfold, including the stuff with Shin and the Majins. He thought it was just a bunch of cheap tricks. They were trying to scare his daughter, but now the ground was shaking. Earth seemed to be crumbling beneath their feet. And when Bardock was finally freed, he thought that it must have simply been some sort of timed adhesive. He was definitely a cheap magician or something. Mr. Satan stepped up, yelling at Bardock that Videl was no longer allowed to go to his dojo. Bardock looked over at Videl, questioning just what the hell was happening. Videl stepped up in front of her father, saying that there are much bigger things going on right now, and that these Saiyans aren't the bad guys he claims they are. They may be weird, they may be stinky, but they're good people. Bardock said that they don't have time for this, turning to Goten and Trunks and asking them if they want to come along, because something's going out with their parents, and they need to stop whatever's happening. Bursting their auras and flying off along with Bardock, Mr. Satan continued to yell at Videl, and in response, she simply grabbed him and flew right behind them too. She was going to show him just what these Saiyans were doing, that none of it was a trick, and that they were good people. Eventually, Z fighters from all over the world began to appear. Tien, Krillin, 18, 17, and 16. Even Gine showed up, much to the behest of Bardock, who yelled at her to get away. She may not really be a fighter, but she was always there to support her family, especially if her grandchildren are involved. On top of Capsule Corp, Kaioshin pointed out something. It was Majin Buu's egg, steaming, with Bobbity right next to it. He was going to be born. Bardock landed, getting a close look at King Vegeta. He didn't care about this Majin Buu guy. He cared more about his friend. He rushed in and tried to shake him out of it, but the king simply headbutted him. Bardock, in response, headbutting him back. Shin said that the king is the least of their problems now. Gohan and the others started blasting at the egg, and it seemed to have done something as Babidi grieved. But a cloud of pink smoke appeared above them all. The pink blob Majin Buu appeared. As everyone was in awe by his power, King Vegeta took the chance to blast down at the heroes, aiming for Goku and Gohan. However, Bardock caught wind of this, appearing before them both and tanking the blast. It hurt him severely, dropping to his knees. It was clear that the Majin and power had done something incredible, but King Vegeta actually reacted to this, as if seeing a father defending his son made him snap into reality again for a second. But as soon as he heard his master's voice, Bobbity, yelling at Majin Buu, he returned. Flying over to Majin Buu and Bobbity, the three of them stood together. Though Majin Buu wouldn't listen, he just wanted to eat. He began to turn different buildings into chocolate and candy. King Vegeta was confused by the whole situation. All rushed in at Majin Buu, trying to drive him away from the city. But King Vegeta kept on trying to get in the way, firing another royal blast. However, this time, it hit his grandson, who was sent flying into his home, landing through a wall of Capsule Corp. Prince Vegeta landed by his son, holding him. He was okay, but hurt. This enraged the prince, and rushing up to his dad, he began to pummel the king, saying that nobody hurts his son, not even his own father. King Vegeta couldn't think straight, but as it seemed like the prince was going to knock him out, Trunks stepped forward, arms spread, right in front of the king. He begged his father to stop. He didn't want him to hurt his granddad any further. Vegeta was still reeling in anger. 
but seeing his son defend him like that, King Vegeta's eyes were locked in on the both of them. His family, what had he done? He looked around, the city was on fire. He had died to protect this earth before, and now he was going to doom it because he was too weak, because he was too frail to defend himself. Something struck him. He began to scream in pain again as Babidi struggled to get a hold of him. Trunks continued to say that it's clear the king is not himself right now. If they want to help his grandfather, they need to defeat Babidi and Majin Buu. Vegeta acknowledged this as he looked at his father, who was clearly being torn apart. Vegeta and Trunks rushed in at Babidi, pushing him away from Majin Buu and pummeling him to the ground. As Buu continued to try to eat more and more chocolate, he fired a candy beam at Goku. Vegeta grabbed him as if he was just the ball. He chucked Babidi towards Majin Buu, but Babidi seemed like he was going to stop himself. Just as the wizard thought he was safe, Trunks came spinning in with a kick, sending him directly into the line of sight of the candy beam. Babidi was defeated turned into chocolate as King Vegeta finally struggled out of his control, the M on his forehead disappearing. It was like taking a deep breath for the first time in a long time. As King Vegeta apologized for his mistakes, the old life of conquering and destroying, sure, it was fun, but this new life of his family, friends, and more. He loved this just as much. He was sorry for having doomed the world. New stories of attacks on the dojo had spread, and people watch on the news as the Saiyans either attack or defend the city. People aren't quite sure. Tensions are higher than ever. Satan calls Videl crazy as she finally lands on top of a building far away enough to be safe, allowing Mr. Satan to watch as the Saiyans and the other warriors faced off against Majin Buu. Gohan notices Videl's presence, flying over to her and telling her to get away, but she insists that her father has to see what this is all about. But Buu becomes aware of this, firing a key ball at Mr. Satan, Gohan, and Videl. Bardock sees this coming and slaps it away, protecting Mr. Satan. Bardock then smirks at him, returning to the battle. The androids in particular begin to show off their respective styles. Android 17, using the rebel techniques taught to him by Bardock, attempting to overwhelm Majin Buu, while Android 16 used the royal styles of King Vegeta. They complemented each other well. Majin Buu extended out his body, turning it into spikes and trying to stab the kids. Piccolo, however, grabbed them both with his stretchy arms, throwing them once again against Majin Buu at an incredible speed, firing at the pink monster. Bits of Buu flew everywhere as he regenerated. That's when King Vegeta thought of something. He was a tactician on planet Vegeta, a brilliant leader to which his people turned to. This role was diminished when Frieza took over, but perhaps this was the role he missed. Not the conquering and all that, but the role of being a leader. Thus, he begins to order his heroes. Instantly, his son thought back to the times King Vegeta led him through battles. It was a nostalgic sight. It was clear that Majin Buu could regenerate at incredible speeds. They need to hit him from every single angle with their strongest attacks, so he has no chance to regenerate. King Vegeta and Bardock from top and bottom, Raditz and Piccolo from the left, 18 and 17 from the right. The half Saiyans alongside Gine fill the spaces in between. The human Z fighters would serve as bait, trying to get Majin Buu into a centralized location. This should destroy Majin Buu to its smallest bits, to which he has to then regenerate in that central location. This will be their chance. They will blow him to such small bits that the next final attack will be his undoing while he's too busy regenerating. Goku and Vegeta looked at each other and nodded. It seemed like he really did want to make amends for what happened with Babidi. Krillin gulps, but Tien rushes out within two seconds. They follow suit as Krillin and Tien make mocking faces alongside Goten and Trunks, baiting Buu into the central spot above the city, where he realizes he's completely surrounded. No! At once, every single Z fighter blessed at the monster. These aliens all defending our planet? Videl smiles, looking at Gohan. That blast signified the saviors of Earth. She wasn't about to stand around and be out of it, leaving her dad on the spot as he yelled at her to come back. Even if it was weak, she had to help somehow. The blast shook the Earth as it dissipated. Hundreds of small boo pieces were gathered on one spot as they began to move in together, ready to reform him. Shen tried his best to freeze in place the pieces of boo. Kakarot, Vegeta, right! The two Saiyans have one arm up each. A giant red and blue energy ball similar to the Big Bang attack containing both of their strongest energy floating above their head. Together, they shoot it down onto the regenerating boo, consuming every bit of it and disintegrating it on impact. It 
seemed like it was finally over as Boo's key disappeared from the world. Kaioshin smiled. They had all done it, saved the universe, and avenged the other Kais. Vegeta, Trunks, and Goten all rushed down to the king as the kids hugged the old man. Vegeta crossed his arms at the king while he nodded at his son. Everything did work out in the end. News helicopters began to fly around the area, landing to check out the battle site, asking questions. What were the Saiyans doing here? Were they attacking Earth? Was the Red Ribbon Army right all along? Some of them tried to interview the Saiyans, which they didn't really appreciate. And they even tried to interview Shin, who was terrified to be on camera. Goten and Trunks actually enjoyed it, saying how much they liked kicking butt, and Raditz treated it like it was just the aftermath of a boxing match. That's when everyone spotted Mr. Satan, trying to climb out of a building. He nearly falls off, but he grabs onto the roof. Videl face palms, but Bardock flies up to him and helps him up. Goku whispers to Videl who the hell he is, and Videl simply sighs, saying that sadly, that's her dad. Newscasters ask Mr. Satan just what transpired. They think that he defeated the pink creature after all, and will now defeat the Saiyans. Mr. Satan laughs. He does like all the attention, and he was about to lie, but he looked at Videl and realized that he couldn't do that anymore. She was right after all. Mr. Satan coughs. No, it looks like there was a misunderstanding. The Saiyans are in fact good. He required their help to defeat Majin Buu. Videl once again face bombs, leaving a red handprint on her face. But Gohan takes it in stride, simply laughing. Bardock is just glad that the humans won't hate them as much anymore. He places his arm around Mr. Satan and says, Yeah, it was quite an honor to fight alongside the legendary Mr. Satan. The newscaster still says that he doesn't believe it, and Mr. Satan replies by saying, Well, believe it, the invaders were not invaders at all. They have been the saviors of Earth. Cheers erupt from the crowd below, celebrating the Saiyans once more. All this attention is gonna be a problem in the future, they were sure of it. Now, it was time to go off and find the Dragon Balls, finally bringing peace to Earth. But not before Kaioshin said one last thing. He admired the way they fought, and invited them to train at the Kaioshin realm one day. Especially the likes of Gohan, there was something special about that kid, and he was the first one to help against Majin Buu. Thus, He's returned to Earth once more. Time has passed ever since the battles against Majin Buu, and now King Vegeta has been struggling after the fact. Inside, he feels that his generation of Saiyans has been rotting away. Babidi's magic made him remember just what made him feel alive as a young man. He now misses the old days when he fought for himself and for planet Vegeta. He doesn't regret the planet conquering of his culture, but he regrets the acts he committed under Frieza, having lived only to serve someone else. One night, he approaches Bardock, asking him if he feels similar to this. He's changed a lot more drastically than the king. He's become more or less a good person. Even so, the thrill of planet conquering was still alive for him. He wondered if perhaps they could get it in a different way. There are still planets out there under Frieza's rule, even without Frieza being around. So, Bardock asks the king one question. What if together, only the two of them, they went out into space and liberated planets from Frieza? After all, it would be like conquering them again. They're kicking out the current rulers. They may not be able to keep the planets, but it's a similar thrill. The king is hesitant. He's not a savior after all, but Bardock argues that it's just another way to kick Frieza from beyond the grave. Finally, after some deliberation, the king agrees. Thus, Bardock and King Vegeta take off into space, going to various planets. Their Super Saiyan 2 power is strong enough to liberate many, and slowly they inch towards a new strength too. They end up on planet Tech Tech, which has been under the rule of Abo and Kado. King Vegeta remembers them from his time on the Frieza Force. They were always really annoying, and just as strong as Zarbon and Doria. What he didn't expect to find there was Tarbo his second-born son. He knew he was out there somewhere in space. Originally, he was a complete disappointment thanks to his low battle power, and Tarbo wasn't exactly thrilled to see him. And even though Tarbo wanted his father to go away, Bardock had a heart-to-heart -heart with Tarbo, telling him that his father had been changing over the past few years, and in fact, they had come here to help the people of Planet Tech Tech. Tarbo couldn't believe it. They weren't nearly strong enough to defeat Abo and Kado. They were strong as Frieza now. That's when Bardock calls on King Vegeta and asks him to show off Super Saiyan. 
Tarbo Scouter explodes, realizing that this may be their only chance at being free. Tarbo still isn't thrilled about his father, but he does introduce him to his wife. The king is a little upset that he hasn't gotten any stronger, but Bardock bumps him telling him to be nice. He's lucky that his kid is alive at all. Doesn't he remind him of someone? King Vegeta sees Kid Trunks in him, and he loves Trunks. Sure, he is different, but he's still a Saiyan, and he's still his family. As father and son finally agree on a middle ground, Abo and Kato attack. Bardock is going to take care of them, but King Vegeta tells Bardock to allow him and Tarbo to do it. Tarbo is nervous, but King Vegeta encourages him, telling him that he is still part of the Saiyan royal bloodline, a bloodline that has now sprouted many super Super Saiyans. Even if he isn't one now, he could be one in the future. Thus, together, King Vegeta and Tarbo battle Abo and Kato, defeating them together. Tarbo isn't able to do much damage, but King Vegeta's Super Saiyan 2 power is enough to kick them to the curve. Even after they fuse, Bardock simply lends his hand and helps defeat Akka. Thus, Planet Tech Tech is finally freed from the Frieza Force rule, as King Vegeta invites Tarbo to Earth. Tarbo isn't sure this is his home, and he wasn't sure if Guru his wife, would want to join, but she hasn't seen Tarbo this happy in many years, and encourages him to go on adventures. Thus, together, Tarbo and Gurit join in, there's a few other planets they go after, and Bardock remembers one in particular, Planet Serial. This was a planet that was conquered by the Saiyans long, long ago, with the race entirely wiped out, except for one kid, whom Bardock, for some reason, he ended up saving. He was wondering if he was still there. The Frieza Force presence would surely still be there, so either way, he wants to save them. Once they get to Planet Serial, they do end up clearing out all of the Frieza Force strongholds, but this catches the attention of one particular individual, Granola. Bardock is surprised to see a Cerulean still alive, as he attacks Bardock, recognizing him as a Saiyan. The kid is good, but this is a Granola before making any wish about getting stronger, so he's relatively low level. Bardock and King Vegeta try to tell him that they're here to help, not destroy the planet, but Granola has had enough. His whole race was wiped out by Saiyans, and he was going to get his revenge right now. It's their fault, they're gone. The altercation continues until Bardock bursts into Super Saiyan 2 and blasts Granola in the face. This finally takes him down to the ground, with him barely able to stand. Granola thinks that he's going to be killed as he closes his eyes, telling the Saiyans that if this is the way it has to be, then at least he will be with his race again. King Vegeta and Bardock look at each other as the king rolls his eyes. Bardock apologizes, kneeling by Granola. This catches him by surprise, and he tries to attack again. But another person appears, Munaito. He had sensed the occurrence, wondering if Granola was in trouble. Once he appeared, he stopped the battle. Granola told him to go away, that he needs to do this by himself now. But Monaito turns around, recognizing the Saiyan with a scar on his face. Bardock, likewise, realizes that this Namekian looks familiar. There aren't many Namekians that he knows of on Planet Serial, so it had to be him. It had to be Monaito, who helped him during the battles against Gas. Granola is completely confused. But Monaito puts all of this at ease, as he begins to explain. Bardock, a long time ago, had actually arrived at Planet Serial, alongside all the Saiyans, and attacked his race. Yes, this much was true. But Bardock saved Granola, and tried to save his mom too. He ended up having a hard-fought battle against Gas, and entrusted Monaito with Granola. Granola had refused to believe this. As King Vegeta looked at Bardock up and down, was this true? Had he been a goody two-shoes all his life? He was pathetic, but he saved it to himself. Bardock said that they were all to blame, even Bardock himself. But ultimately, it was Frieza who was calling the shots, and Bardock was one of the few Saiyans who ended up standing against him. In the end, it was thanks to King Vegeta, Bardock, and the rest of their family that Frieza was dead. This caught Granola by surprise. It was them that killed Frieza? That's when he realized the form he used against him. That was what killed Frieza, wasn't it? As Monaito led them to his house, showing Granola the scouter, which finally revealed the truth. The voice coming from it was definitely Bardock, as the old Saiyan reminisced of a time when he saved that kid. But not only that, he would argue that Granola saved his life too. It was thanks to him that he decided to act against Frieza. Bardock continues to say that Granola was 100% justified in hating the Saiyans all these years, but now both of their races were gone because of Frieza. Now that he is dead, they can move on forward together. Bardock invites Granola to Earth if he wants a new home. Granola doesn't want to leave his home world behind. 
After all, he is the only Cerealian left on Planet Serial, but he does promise to go visit. He wants to learn more. And if Bardock and King Vegeta are so much stronger than him, then he wants to train. It was a meaningful reunion for Bardock. Meanwhile, on Earth, Raditz begins his training with Vegeta once more, trying to catch up to Kakarot and the others. He often visits Capsule Corp, where he becomes acquainted with Bulma's sister, Tights. The two start to get close, as she recognizes him as a boxer. Raditz had too much money and nothing to do with it, so Tights was definitely interested. Meanwhile, Gohan went on to train with a sea sword at the Kaioshin realm. Unlike the original story, he doesn't break it, not yet. But he does get much stronger, and he begins implementing sword fighting into his martial arts. Though the sword itself is not allowed to leave the realm unless there's a huge threat. And so, more times begin to pass on by. Despite the acceptance of humanity, the Saiyans largely still choose to live in solitude. Raditz has become more active with his family and training, but remains at the lookout, as he's become good friends with Dende, though he still continues to box every now and then. Most professional scenes don't allow him in, as he seems to have an unfair advantage as he's an alien. Now he just does exhibition matches. He has a little capsule home at the lookout, which Tide often visits. She's still not used to all this crazy stuff, and had no idea her sister was so involved with aliens. King Vegeta has moved to a house close to Vegeta's own capsule corp, living alongside Tarbol and Gure. Bardock and King Vegeta's dojo welcomes more students over time, and Sixteen is now a teacher there. Even Granola visits the dojo, though his bounty hunting business keeps him very busy in space. He's getting stronger and stronger over time, and likes to train with Goku. But Gine doesn't know what to do with most of it, choosing to spend some of it on Bardock's dojo and letting Chi Chi decide what to do with the rest. They live in a nice home, bigger than the one Goku has in the original story, but nothing extravagant. Out of all the students in the dojo right now, Tarbo has proven to be a rising star. He is motivated to catch up to his father and brother, to prove that he can stand alongside them as warriors. Vegeta wasn't too sure what to make of him living on Earth now, after seeing him for the first time in such a long time. But there is a fire in his eyes that was never there before. Perhaps battling alongside his father did something, but eventually it was time for Bulma's party. And of course, Gine is catering it, while Raditz brings a date, tights. However, Far, far away, Lord Beerus, the god of destruction, awakens to a premonition about a Super Saiyan God. Whis informs him that indeed Saiyans are still around, and some of them even defeated Frieza. Most now live on Earth. Beerus is confused. Saiyans living on a backwater planet? Whatever happened to Frieza? It couldn't really have been them to have defeated him, right? But Whis continues saying that not only did they achieve the Super Saiyan legend, but have gone even further beyond. Beerus makes up his mind. It's time to go to Earth and investigate. Soon enough, they appear at Capsule Corp. King Vegeta sits further away from the party, simply watching everyone as he drinks, when suddenly a voice is heard from behind. Lord Beerus, surprised to see the king is still around, whispering to himself that Frieza really did suck at his job. King Vegeta is absolutely terrified. Beerus was one of the few people in the universe he actually feared, remembering what it was like to live under his boot for a long time. Was he worse than Frieza? He wasn't sure, but he was at least scarier. He bowed at Beerus, who told him to simply stand up. He's not gonna place his feet on him like last time. He's just looking for something called the Super Saiyan God. King Vegeta isn't sure what he's talking about. But, to save face, he says he's going to ask the others, quickly going to Vegeta and Tarbo and warning them. They too know about Lord Beerus. King Vegeta convinces his sons to be on their best behavior and attend to all of Beerus and Whis's needs, or else they're going to blow up the planet. He's looking for something called the Super Saiyan God. Still, none of them know what it is. Beerus looks around, a little grossed out. He liked Saiyans just fine, but they were eating food like crazy. He started to pick things here and there to make sure that he got some food before it all ran out. Bardock is also informed about Beerus, but he's not scared of him. He can't even really sense his key. If he needs to get kicked out, then he'll do it. But King Vegeta stops him, right as he slams his hands down in front of Beerus. He was about to ask him why he's acting all high and mighty around his family. 
but King Vegeta stops it, telling them that it's time for bingo, and all three of the royals perform the bingo dance. Bardock laughs hysterically. Beerus doesn't really care about this Bardock guy. He seems way too confident for a low-class Saiyan. But Beerus is starting to get bored, and thinks it's rude that Gine didn't save him any pudding. The Sun family had eaten it all, after all. He starts to demand of Gine to make more food, and Gine doesn't really appreciate this. Bardock yells at Beerus not to talk to his wife like that. The God of Destruction laughs, stepping up to Gine, telling her that she's a really good cook. It's too bad the planet will now have to be destroyed. Goku, Raditz, and the others start to stand up. Gine is the sweetest person in the world, and no one's going to talk to her like that. Their auras spark up as Beerus smiles. If not one of them is a Super Saiyan God, then he really will destroy Earth. He wags his finger, telling them to come at him. Bardock screams out as they all rush in. Vegeta's family face palms. Of course, it would be Bardock's family to cause this. They were too quick to battle and had no decorum, not like the king and his family. It's clear that the god of destruction is way too powerful for all of them. Goku and Vegeta, however, have a trick up their sleeves. Beerus, hoping that this is the Super Saiyan God, lets it happen. The two Saiyans show off their brand new Super Saiyan 3 transformation, shaking the entire world and the boat as they transform. Beerus is impressed that that is quite a power-up compared to the others, but he doubts it's what he was looking for. King Vegeta and Bardock are proud of their sons. They had grown so much. They had no idea they had even achieved that state. Clearly, they were saving it for a special occasion. Too bad it had to be spoiled here. Everyone is sure that Goku and Vegeta can defeat Beerus now, but are deeply disappointed to see that this, in fact, was not the case. Goku and Vegeta are quickly defeated, and Beerus asks if there's any any god of destruction around here. That's when Gohan steps up to the plate. He's dragging something heavy, sending sparks across the floor. Beerus's eyes widen as he recognizes that sword. Gohan, who had been training at the Kaioshin realm for some time now, announces himself as the Super Saiyan God, once again showing off his cocky attitude. It made sense to him. He had been training under gods, and he was a Saiyan. Surely he was the Super Saiyan God now. One of the many techniques that Kaioshin taught him was Kai Kai, which he used to teleport to the Kaioshin realm and take the sea sword. even while Shin and Kibito yelled at him to come back. They were terrified about what Beerus would do now. Beerus told him to put that sword down before he regrets it, but Gohan wouldn't listen, and he continued to attack over and over. Gohan was fast. He had changed a lot over the training with the sea sword, and Beerus wanted him to put it down. In a desperate move, Beerus finally blocks the attack. This proves to be a mistake, however, as the sea sword split in half. Gohan gulped. Surely Shin would kill him now. Beerus hugged Whis, thinking that he was going to disappear, but he didn't. He looked back to see that, in fact, breaking the sea sword freed the old Kai, and seemingly, the two of them were no longer attached. Long ago, Beerus had been the one to trap the old Kai inside the sea sword, and now he was just confused about what was happening. Beerus and the old Kai reunite for the first time in a millennia, and Gohan is just left there are confused. The old Kaioshin wants to go to his realm, but Beerus tells him to just wait. He has bigger things to deal with now. Meanwhile, in the Kaioshin realm, neither Kibito nor Shin can believe what they're seeing. A Kai was trapped there the whole time? Beerus says that it's a miracle that he's not dead, and that if he makes him angry, he's gonna put him right back into a different sword. But the mention of a miracle actually gives Bulma an idea, using the Dragon Balls to wish for a Super Saiyan God. The old Kai argues against this, saying that the Namekian wish orbs go against against the natural order of things. But Beerus tells him to shut up, as Shenron is summoned, and it's revealed that a ritual is needed to bring forth that god. As Beerus brings up the fact that there are way too many Saiyans here anyways, why don't they create two Super Saiyan gods? Gohan chuckles. Is he sure he can take both of them? The Destroyer growls. He beat him once already. If he doesn't want to die, then he'll keep his mouth shut. Videl, just like in the original story, reveals that she is in fact pregnant, and they wonder who the Saiyans chosen should be. Though most people say Goku and Vegeta, including the King and Bardock, they don't want to get help achieving a power even further beyond. They instead suggest King Vegeta and Bardock. Bardock looks at King Vegeta, telling him that maybe this is exactly what they needed. He felt like their generation was dying off, right? Maybe this is their one last chance at a hurrah. Thus, Goku, Gohan, Goten, Gine, Videl, and Bardock hold hands, giving birth to Super Saiyan God Bardock, while Vegeta, Trunks, Tarbo, Raditz, Goten, and King Vegeta bring forth Super Saiyan God King Vegeta. Trunks complains that Goten got to do it twice. The Saiyans were in awe of this power. The King and Bardock felt as if they were rejuvenated. They quickly turn around to look at the God of Destruction. Immediately, the vicinity of the boat became the battle's epicenter, with energy blasts shooting off into the distance, creating massive waves that rocked the boat violently. 
Every powerful strike caused ripples in the water as the sheer heat of the aura began to vaporize some of it. As the battle was moved above the ocean, the Saiyans forced Beerus away from the boat, gaining an advantage. But the power of the Super Saiyan God was new to them, and they struggled to maintain the strength. Seeing this vulnerability, Beerus retaliated, landing blow after blow. But the Saiyans were determined, remembering their families on the boat. They continued to combine their forces, fighting together like never before. They were in sync, surprising Goku and Vegeta. Maybe starting that dojo together wasn't such a bad idea then. The two Saiyans launched at Beerus, their combined power forming a brilliant light that outshone the sun. They clashed in the atmosphere, causing shockwaves that descended to Earth, tearing apart mountains and oceans alike. But in an unforeseen move, Beerus forced both of them down, plunging towards Earth at tremendous speed. The three of them crashed into the surface, digging deep into the crust and continuing towards the molten core. Within the scorching core of the Earth, surrounded by molten lava, the final moments of the battle began. King Vegeta and Bardock realized their godly power was waning, and the heat of the Earth was becoming too much. As Beerus rose up above, ready to fire one last blast, King Vegeta and Bardock put their hands together, cupping them in the middle to create one royal rebellion blaster. They shouted in unison, firing the blue beam, surrounded by twirling red energy. Beerus was taken aback by the force of the attack, and was actually pushed back momentarily the entire planet trembled as the lava around them swirled. They managed to push back the attack, saving Earth from sure destruction. But as their energy faded, King Vegeta and Bardock were exhausted and overheated, falling unconscious and falling onto the molten core. It looked like they were going to be consumed by the Earth itself, but surprisingly, Beerus swooped down, catching them both by their arms and shooting upwards, leaving the core and emerging back onto the boat. He placed the two Saiyans gently on the ground as he looked at them with a hint of respect in his eyes. He commented to himself, You Saiyans have truly changed a lot. He looked at the king, protecting his family like that, leading the charge. Ironically enough, after his race was destroyed, only now was he truly a king. But the low-class Saiyan warrior too had surprised him. Maybe they were worth keeping around. As they slowly come back to consciousness, they see their family surrounding them. Gine hooks Bardock tightly, but then they realize Beerus is still there, and they get on guard immediately. Beerus just smirks, saying that he has decided to spare Earth and these dumb little Saiyans for now, but wonders if perhaps they would like to train at his planet one day. King Vegeta and Bardock look at each other in confusion. Really? But in a way, they had gotten what they wanted. They got their fighting spirit back like never before, and felt like they did back when they were young. There was no need to kill or conquer anymore. The strength the Super Saiyan God gave them, that was what true power felt like. But even so, King Vegeta spoke up, saying, no. He denied training with Beerus, at least for now. Instead, he said that the next generation of Saiyan should be the one getting that privilege. He looked over to Raditz, Goku, Vegeta, and Tarbul. Tarbul is on shore and really nervous about it, but Gurei encourages him. She's seen him very happy training with Vegeta and the others. Maybe it's time to step it up a notch. He finally agrees. Raditz is excited to catch up to Goku and the others, while Goku and Vegeta simply fist bump. We smirks. He would have his hands full with these Saiyans, but training at their planet begins. Just a little bit after, they prove that they can really cook some good food. And thus, Tarbo and Raditz begin to develop their own sort of rivalry, yet they treat each other with a lot more kindness when compared to Goku and Vegeta. But also, I now realize that I just called her Pan during the Battle of Gods section. But just like Goten before, she was given a Saiyan name. After all, her family is much more connected to the Saiyan roots. Bardock had always told Gohan everything about the Saiyans and his adventures out there in space. But one name stood in his mind, Fasha, an old member of Bardock's squad. He thought his brother is already named Tora. Why not Fasha for his daughter? For the sake of ease, we'll continue calling her Pan. Yeah. But soon another threat would come to Earth. Lord Frieza has been revived by Sorbet after using the Dragon Balls on Earth. His chilling presence sent ripples of fear across the universe as his spaceship appeared above Earth. However, King Vegeta and Bardock, who were both training at their dojo, instantly recognized that key, and they weren't about to stand back and watch as he destroyed their new home planet. They didn't know how he was back. But they didn't care. They had unfinished business if he had returned. They were the first to confront him, appearing in front of the spaceship as Frieza rose and fired a blast to destroy a nearby city. Bardock and the king worked together to slap the blast away and up to the sky. From down below, news reporters zoomed in as everyone in the world began to cheer for the two Saiyans. 
Cameras then turned to look at Frieza's cold, calculating face, broadcasting his arrival to millions of viewers. They weren't sure who this man was, but if the Saiyans were fighting him, then surely he was evil. As the world watched in trepidation, the king landed before the emperor, telling him to turn back now or die. There was something different about the Saiyans. Not only did they seem stronger than the last time he fought them, but they seemed more willing to die for this pathetic planet. Slowly, other Z fighters began to appear, including Gohan, who reveals his brand new potential unleash state. After Beerus left, Gohan teleported the old Kai back to the Kaioshin realm, where he complained about his back hurting because of all the sword swinging Gohan had been doing. But he had to admit, that kid had potential, so much so that he thought it'd be worth unlocking. Sure, he's no Super Saiyan God, but he's far above the one in canon at this time. They make quick work of the Frieza soldiers, none of them being enough to bother them. Krillin, 18, Tien, Piccolo, and the others are also stronger than their canon counterparts, all thanks to training with so many Saiyans. But the real showdown was between Frieza and the duo of Super Saiyan gods, King Vegeta and Bardock. The sky was ablaze with energy as Bardock and King Vegeta faced off against Frieza, who was surprised to see the red hue. They seemed weaker than the Super Saiyans, but in fact were stronger than ever before. With every passing second, the Saiyan duo gained the upper hand. They were going to show Frieza that they were not inconveniences like Frieza once thought. He was just here for revenge. He was killed once by Bardock and his family, and he was going to do the same to him. The rebels struck Frieza with swift and relentless energy blast, while King Vegeta burst around him and kicked him into said blast, forcing Frieza into the defensive as he was hit. But Frieza had a dark secret waiting. It seemed like the Saiyans had declared their victory as Frieza fell to the ground, extremely hurt. But with a smirk, he began to transform, his aura shifting into a deep gold, transforming into Golden Frieza proclaiming himself to be the ultimate warrior, inspired by the golden hue of the Saiyans that killed him long ago. Golden Frieza was a force to be reckoned with, multiplying his speed and power, and completely overwhelming the king and the prince. They continued to try their best, but they were completely outmatched. Even though they were battered and bruised, their key could be sensed, exactly what they were hoping for. After all, there were few people out there who could sense their god key, including Goku and Vegeta. With the Earth's defenders on the brink of defeat, Frieza rose up to the sky and began creating a supernova, ready to destroy the entire planet. But suddenly the sound of teleportation echoed, as Goku, Vegeta, Raditz, and Tarbul appeared. They had been training at Beerus' planet, ready to show off their brand new transformation. But Frieza began to speak. They didn't seem that different from before, and he was much more interested in fighting Vegeta and Goku, prodigal Saiyans seeking revenge. But his eyes fell on Raditz and Tarbul. A cruel laughter erupting. He had seen both of them before. True, Raditz had been one of the Saiyans to defeat him long ago, but he was always the weakest, always behind his brother and his father, the lowest of the low class Saiyans. And Tarbul, a disappointment to the royal blood. At least Prince Vegeta knew his place. Tarbul, on the other hand, had been kicked off by his own father. This didn't sit well with Goku in the slightest, as he watched Raditz and Tarbul looked down in shame. But they had been training, they had been getting stronger. He wasn't going to allow Frieza to undermine their efforts, as Goku responded by saying that everyone has potential for greatness, especially those he underestimates. Vegeta just crossed his arms and smirked, saying, They are Saiyans after all, remember that. He didn't want to fight those weaklings, he wanted to fight Goku and Vegeta, charging towards them. But Raditz and Tarbul were determined to prove just how strong they had gotten. The atmosphere grew thick in tension as Raditz and Tarbul positioned themselves between Golden Frieza and the others. Their transformations were breathtaking, a fiery blue aura enveloping them. This was Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan. Frieza was amused, but he wasn't threatened. Not yet. He couldn't sense them after all. He simply commented on the weaklings having learned a new trick. But without waiting for a response, Raditz and Tarbul charged. It was clear that Tarbul wasn't nearly as developed as Raditz, and Raditz wasn't as developed as Vegeta and Goku. But they had changed a lot since they started training with Whis, and moved leagues ahead of most others. The tyrant found himself being pummeled by the two Saiyans, whom he had once dismissed as insignificant. It was evident that for all three of them, these new transformations were too much for them. Their stamina began to drain. 
Goku and Vegeta noticed this. They had to finish Freeze before Raditz and Tarbo lost their transformation, but they were happy seeing them like this, testing themselves. That was the reason they didn't intervene just yet. Each strike, dodge and blast continued to drain them, but for Raditz and Tarbo in particular, their determination more than made up for it, as slowly it seems like Frieza's golden form began to crack. But as Raditz began to sparkle in and out of Super Saiyan Blue, Goku couldn't stand aside any longer, and with a battle cry, joined in with his brother. Together, they two comboed Frieza up to the sky between themselves. Frieza had forgotten how much painful it could be to be hit by Goku, as the sky lit up with the blue glow of the two sons of Bardock. They rocketed him up to the sky with tremendous force, before hammer-fisting him back down to the ground. Seeing this opportunity, King Vegeta burst once more into Super Saiyan God and called on his children to join him, as Super Saiyan Blue Tarball and Vegeta cupped their hands into a Gallic gun. They made a triangle together, firing their blast at Frieza as he came down. Bardock was in awe. Last time, him and his family had been the ones to defeat Frieza. Now it was the king truly a testament to how much he had changed. King Vegeta's red energy imbued with the power of the gods mixed with the blue godly hue of Tarbo and Vegeta. Frieza was consumed by the force, the golden transformation melting from his body as he perished once more. The landscape was left marked by his arrival, but the rest of the world was saved as across each city and the planet, cheers erupted celebrating the Saiyans once more. Beerus and Whis had finally arrived, proud to see the students passing this test. The victory was particularly sweeter for Raditz and Tarbo. They stepped from the shadows of their more powerful family members and carved their own place. But soon more ships began to appear, asking for interviews from King Vegeta and the others. What was that form? Was this all special effects? Most of them weren't comfortable with this. Only Raditz was really giving an interview, being his pompous self and telling them that this was really just training for his next exhibition match. Gohan too liked the attention, which made Videl back at home roll her eyes. Though his little daughter cheered for her father. As the interviews continue, Piccolo realizes that none of them are really comfortable with this. As he opens his eyes suddenly, and all the cameras explode. The reporters are disappointed as the Saiyans simply fly away. They have to return to their training. Unknown to them, a darkness even greater than Frieza lurked beyond. The excitement of Frieza's revival proved to be too much for Tarbo. He's okay with the power he has, but that's about enough training for now. He also missed his wife, Gure. He didn't want to stay away from her for any much longer. Shampa then shows up, challenging Beerus to a tournament, just like in the original story. Bardock thinks tournaments are dumb and refuses to participate. However, he does think of someone that could enter, Granola, the young boy he saved a long time ago and later reunited with during his travels alongside King Vegeta. When Bardock approaches Granola, about this, he is a little apprehensive. A tournament for the sake of Earth? But Bardock explained to Granola that he'd get to fight strong people and train with them. The prospect of training with Bardock caught his eye in particular. Thus, the team trained for a bit, with Granola growing rapidly at the dojo King Vegeta and Bardock shared. He was still below the Saiyans, but his tenacity and willingness to catch up really shone bright. Plus, those eyes of his were uniquely accurate, and he never really missed a shot. Thus, the team heads off to the nameless planet alongside their friends. Granola got to know Goku and the others. He thought they were all a bunch of weirdos and didn't exactly like Saiyans still, but at least he knew they weren't about to kill him. Turbo was also asked to enter, but he denied this time. Universe 7 is composed of Goku, Vegeta, Raditz, Granola, and King Vegeta, while Universe 7 is Botamo, Frost, Magetta, Kaba, and Hit. The Vegetas are surprised to see another Saiyan from a different universe, as he reveals that in his universe, the Saiyans prospered and became a force for good. This also surprised Granola, rolling his eyes. King Vegeta laments that his race was doomed due to his actions, but Prince Vegeta assures him that he has changed for the better. At the very least, he should be glad of that. In another universe, the Saiyans went on to have a better path. Kaba is curious to see more out of the prince and the king. The first one to step up to the ring is Raditz versus Botamo. Raditz attempts to get things done quickly by using Super Saiyan, but quickly realizes that everything bounces off of Botamo. He continues to try everything, assuming that he can break him down eventually, as everyone else yells at him to use his head. If he can't be defeated like this, then how can he? For once in his life, Raditz will have to strategize. He rushed forward as Botamo tried to punch him, disappearing and reappearing behind him and wrapping his arms around his head. Botamo slammed him down, but Raditz wouldn't let go, no matter how much it hurt. 
until finally he knocked out Botamo by choking him out. A little more violent than what Goku would have done. The fights continued with Frost, which was much more fun for Raditz, as he actually wants to prove once more that he's stronger than anyone like Frieza. But he did want to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. After all, he is said to be a good guy. However, when Frost transforms, Granola stands up and shouts to watch out for his arm. Raditz yells back that he doesn't need any help. How wrong he was as Frost quickly takes him out with poison. Raditz is declared to have lost, and King Vegeta steps up to the plate. He thinks Granola must have known something the others didn't, so he makes sure to avoid all the punches and keep Frost at bay while using Super Saiyan Blue. Frost attempted to corner the Saiyan King with a flurry of punches, but the King was untouchable, his movements a blur. With a strategic mind, he kept his distance. In response, King Vegeta unleashed a barrage of Ki Blast, each one more intense than the last. A cascade of energy keeping Frost away. One single blast thundered against him, finally letting his defenses down. King Vegeta seized the moment, powering up a massive final flash. The golden beam roared against Frost, engulfing him and taking him out of the ring. When the light faded, Frost was defeated, and King Vegeta stood victorious with not a trace of poison. Frost was revealed to be a cheater, as Granola finally pointed out what he saw, the end of the needle shining. The angered King Vegeta kicked him in the chest. He would not allow another evil door like Frieza to win against him. Raditz apologized to Granola, while the king thanked him for his help. Next up was King Vegeta vs Mageta, to which King Vegeta uses elaborate insults once he realizes Mageta is getting his feelings hurt. But they're actually so elaborate that Mageta doesn't actually get them at first. That was until Krillin asked what one of them meant, and Bulma replied by saying it was... Once Mageta realized what it meant, he was destroyed and blasted away by a royal flash. Next up was Kaba, whom King Vegeta was most excited to fight. Once he wakes up, King Vegeta mentions to Kaba that he reminds him a lot of Tarbul, his younger son. Kaba says that he'd like to meet him one day. The king is surprised to see just how much vigor Kaba has. His moves were more elegant and flowing, unlike the heaviness the Saiyans from Planet Vegeta used to have. Even so, Kaba stood no chance against Super Saiyan Blue, but King Vegeta took the chance to ask Kaba one thing. If he wants to learn how to get stronger, if he wants to learn how to be a Super Saiyan, then he must promise him to take him to Planet Sadala and show him around. Kaba accepts just that, before being quickly knocked out by Super Saiyan Blue King Vegeta. And so the final contestant steps up to the plate, Hit. However, this goes nothing like King Vegeta thought. The king was already cocky, thinking that he'd already shown just how far ahead of everyone Saiyans were. That was until Hit simply used his time skip and quickly knocked out the king. Everyone was in shock, except for one person. Granola could see just what Hit was doing. He couldn't quite process it, but it was clear to him that something was going on with time. Granola is the next one up. They're both bounty hunters. And though Granola tries to talk about that with Hit, Hit clearly seems not interested. The two of them approach each other like cowboys. Granola snickers, not liking how cocky he is. So, he's going to belt him one. His eyes saw exactly what his trick was. Granola fainted an attack, but right as Hit used his time skip, Granola shifted his body. This surprised Hit, as he didn't have enough time to readjust himself. Once he came back, Granola struck him with several sniper shots, right to his vital points attempting to slow him down. Skipping in time won't help you if you can't move. The bounty hunter of Universe 6 is surprised. He's actually struggling, despite Granola being weaker than him. But Granola knows, if Hit can strike him with one powerful blow, he is done for. It's up to the next attack to end it all. The two of them have a stare down, intensity filling the air. Until Granola and Hit finally rush at each other, it's unclear just who's going to get the final strike. Everyone holds in their breath as Granola comes out of the other side, fist up in the air, blood covering it. Hit actually stumbles, wiping some blood of his cheek, but he quickly stabilizes himself as Granola falls to the ground, knocks out. Hit smirks. He was an interesting guy, no doubt a great bounty hunter in his own universe. Despite his lack of power, he still stood up to him. Bardock ran to Granola and congratulated him on a job well done. Granola is disappointed he couldn't win, but Bardock says he did great and that if Vegeta wins, it'll be because of how much Granola hurt hit. Vegeta enters the ring and quickly takes note of the points Granola had struck. He can use this to his advantage, but he can't make it obvious. Vegeta turns into a Super Saiyan God 
taunting Hit into attacking. He burst into blue for a split second to move quicker, striking one of Hit's vital points just as he time skips. But it happened again and again. Hit can't cover them all at once. Granola had done too much damage. Hit wasn't an idiot, however, and quickly adapted, defending himself as much as he could. Even so, he was hurt by Granola, and Vegeta could take advantage of that. But as the battle continued, Hit's defenses seemed impenetrable. Vegeta had to do something. He was being forced to use a further evolution from Super Saiyan Blue. He had been saving for a special occasion, but no better time to show it off than now. Inspired by his royal bloodline, Vegeta used Super Saiyan Saiyan Blue Evolution. The burst of energy not only distracting Hit, but also speeding up Vegeta to a point where he was able to duck under a punch thrown at him by Hit. This power was incredible. Vegeta was truly above everybody there now, taking the surprise chance to kick Hit one final time in the rinse. The last place Granola had struck, Hit was sent flying out of bounds at the same time as he punched Vegeta. The two of them expelled each other out, knocked out of the ring. It seemed to them that it was at the exact same time, so it was a draw. And with Goku being the only one left from Universe 7, he was automatically declared the winner. Bardock cheered, putting an arm around Granola and telling him that, see, it was because of him that Vegeta won. Granola was proud, though Vegeta denied that he needed his help. King Vegeta was proud. His son had surpassed him long ago. He had thought that their royal bloodline was doomed to be second in comparison to Bardock's, but it was good to see that they were still in the running. Vegeta was tired, panting, and hurt. Bardock and King Vegeta couldn't help but approach him, excited, asking about that new form. Kakarot decided that he'll take a different path as he continues to move forward. But evolving Super Saiyan Blue like that, yeah, Vegeta was a genius. Goku is very disappointed he didn't get to fight, and makes Hit promise that they would get to fight one day. Hit can see the fire within Goku's eyes, and agrees just to see what he's made of. The people from Universe 7 sure are interesting. And just like the original, they wish for a new Earth for Universe 6, when Zeno appears astounded at the idea of a tournament. Everyone is too scared to approach him, even Goku himself, as this one is of course different from the one we know. Despite this, when Zeno gets explained to him just what a tournament is, Goku perks up, saying that they should have another. Everyone tells Goku to shut up, but he can't help it. He didn't get to fight in this one, and he is upset about it. Goku suggests an idea for a future tournament, and Zeno agrees enthusiastically. He'll organize that sometime soon. King Vegeta's flabbergasted, but Bardock is secretly kind of excited to see what kind of warriors are there in other universes. Before heading off, Kaba promises to bring the prince and the king to planet Sadala someday. He especially wants King Vegeta to meet King Sadala and to learn that Super Saiyan. And so the plan is set, and the Saiyans of Universe 7 can get ready to travel to Universe 6. Some time passes, and King Vegeta, Bardock, Vegeta, and Goku all go to Planet Sadala following the tournament. Whis and Beerus had scored them there, as Shampa and Vados come along. The two cats heard there was gonna be food at this celebration, so they decided to join in. Kaba escorts them all across Planet Sadala before finally introducing them all to King Sadala at the Royal Palace. The Universe 6 and Universe 7 royal families have a lot of catching up to do, and there is a huge feast for the Saiyans to enjoy. Shampa and Beerus are distracted with all the food. It's a good time all around, though there is some tension since King Vegeta heavily disagrees with a lot of the culture. All this peace and love. There was one Saiyan that tried to steal from them on the way to the palace. She seemed like she had the right idea. Saiyans are supposed to be more mischievous, not knowing that this girl was Kale working for Khalifla. Prior to continuing the tour, King Vegeta approached Beerus regarding something he had in mind. He had a heart-to-heart -heart with the God of Destruction, something which caught him by surprise. King Vegeta Vegeta explained that he has been thinking about what his legacy will be. He knew that he had been trailing behind Kakarot and Vegeta and even Bardock at times, but he wanted to show them that he was still a powerful warrior, at least one last time before he passed. Bira saw the true yearning in his eyes and accepted he would continue to train him and prepare him for something new, the power of the gods. King Vegeta smiled as he looked on at Vegeta training with Kaba. They would be the legacy of the Saiyans. His kids, their kids, Universe 6, he had a lot to leave behind, but he had to go out with a bang. It would take a lot of hard work, and he wouldn't be ready for a long time. But he promised himself he would leave Vegeta with a goal to strive towards.
Meanwhile, back in Universe 7's Earth, Gine and Goten are delivering food to Bulma and Trunks at Capsule Corp when a time machine crashes nearby. Future Trunks steps out in a daze, confused and hurt. He immediately sees Gine and tries to attack. The boys are barely able to hold him off as Future Trunks shouts that he should have never trusted them. I was a fool to think you'd save our world. Nothing good can ever come from the Saiyans. You've doomed us all. Gine is shocked and hurt to hear all of this until another portal opens up in the sky. From that hole comes an invader and it looks like Raditz. Raditz lands before Future Trunks, eager to finish him off, but Gine rises up, demanding to hear an explanation to this. Raditz simply laughs. He wasn't one of her allies. She was just a stupid, filthy mortal, and she would be cleansed like the rest. With Goten and Trunks already hurt, Gine has no option but to stand up to her own son. It is a gruesome sight, as Raditz is far more powerful than Gine. In just a few blasts, Gine is sent to the floor. The kids continue to try and support Gine, but nothing seems to work. All this fighting and rising in power finally gets the attention of the real Raditz, as well as Tarbul, who zoom across the sky and land in front of the kids. Realizing that the man attacking them is a mirror version of Raditz. The evil Raditz is eager to continue fighting, but he starts getting pulled into another time rift. Right before he gets pulled away, he blasts the time machine before the villain finally disappears. The Z fighters are left utterly confused as Future Trunks finally gets his bearings. He apologizes to Gine before he begins to explain his story. He now sees that they are not the evil ones. His plan worked. He had returned to the past. After helping the Z fighters defeat the androids, Future Trunks Trunks returned to his own timeline, where he defeated many threats such as the androids Cell, Babidi and Dabura, and trained under the Kaioshin. His earth was starting to be rebuilt, until one day, the Saiyans attacked. The various Saiyans he had met in the past were here in his timeline, destroying everything. The original Saiyan invaders had returned with new black clothing and terrifying power. It was not dissimilar to when the Saiyans originally invaded Earth at the beginning of the story. Future Trunks was unable to stop them, trying his best to save as many people as he could. But it was all for nothing. None of them can believe it. Future Trunks asks where his father and grandfather are. And Bulma tells him that Goku, Vegeta, the King, and Bardock are visiting another universe. Trunks had no idea there was other universes but he would love to visit. As Bulma repairs the time machine, Future Trunks catches up on everything he's missed. He meets Tarbol and Guri, surprised to know that he has an uncle. He wonders where the Tarbol in his timeline is. He'll have to visit planet Tech Tech one day, with no Goku and Vegeta to help, as well as no other leads. Raditz and Tarbol offer to help Future Trunks instead. However, Trunks isn't sure that they can. Last time he met Raditz, he was still the weakest of the Saiyans. That's when Raditz shows off Super Saiyan Blue. He's a lot stronger than he ever was before and tells Strongs not to underestimate him. They just hope that Goku and Vegeta will return to their universe soon. Without much of a choice, the trio enter the repaired time machine and head back to the future. Once they arrive, Future Trunks introduces them to Future Mai as they all see the devastation. There are some humans they recognize, such as Yajirobe, and they are all terrified of them. In particular, Raditz. Apparently, he was one of the nastiest evildoers out there. He tried to promise them that it wasn't him. But Raditz Black soon appeared over the city, blasting indiscriminately at various buildings. Trunks told them to stay back. They need to make a plan first, but Raditz couldn't just sit back and wait while that man walked around pretending to be him, killing innocent beings. He caught himself saying that. He never thought that he'd be defending people like that. Raditz burst into Super Saiyan God, shooting a blast at the back of Raditz Black. That one actually hurt. Raditz Black turned back with a sadistic smile, welcoming his other self to the future. He's gonna enjoy killing him again. I finally found you, Faker. Faker. I'll show you that you're the only Faker around here. You're comparing yourself to me? Ha! You're not even good enough to be my Fake. I'll make you eat those words! Super Saiyan God Raditz bursts forward against his imposter. Despite the villain's immense power, Raditz still has the upper hand for a while. But he realizes that over time, Raditz Black is improving. As the battle goes on, he has to be defeated quickly. Whoever this guy is has some crazy abilities. But as the battle continues, Raditz is kicked away by a familiar face and into a building, turning to see his father. He's then struck by a key blast from the side turning around to see his mother. Finally, Raditz is stabbed from behind, coughing up blood as he hears the voice coming from behind. 
his own brother, Kakarot. Bardock, Gine, and Goku Black had arrived to assist Raditz Black as our hero falls to the ground. Tarbo can't believe it, he had been watching from an opening, and though Trunks tries to warn him, Tarbo simply roars, bursting into Super Saiyan Blue and charging towards the villains alongside Trunks, having no option but to assist his uncle. Raditz slowly got up, unwilling to give up. He stood back to back with Trunks and Tarbo, their auras crackling with energy. Without a word, the two groups charged. The initial clash was a cacophony of energy blasts, sword strikes, and the relentless clash of fists. Tarbo found himself squaring off against Guinea Black, their power level seemingly matched. They exchanged a series of rapid blows and dodges and quick blasts. With a powerful kick, Tarbo sent Guinea crashing into a nearby building, only for Bardock to appear behind him and kick him right into her blast. Trunks wielded his sword and engaged Goku and Bardock Black simultaneously. Trunks was powerful but not nearly strong enough to fight them. They managed to flank Trunks and deliver a powerful punch, while Raditz grappled his other self. Slowly, the heroes were managing to gain an upper hand. Working together to divide the villains up, Tarbo was dealing well until he was finally blasted away once more. As the Black Saiyans reveal their true intentions, they wish to enact their Zero Mortals plan and purge all mortals of their sin. Only then will every universe be truly free. Future Trunks was one of the greatest sinners of all, altering timeline. The evil Saiyans then fired a combined blast of the heroes, with Tarbo and Trunks opening their auras and firing off a family Gallic gun. It buys them just enough time for them to tell Raditz to run and get help. With no other choice, Raditz returns to the past, grabbing future Mai along the way and going into the ship. They get away just in time. Mai calls out for help as Bulma comes out. She begins to nurse Raditz back to health, and during that time, Goku, Vegeta, and their families arrive. Finally, Bulma seems to have gotten in contact with them and Whis. Informing them of the situation, Raditz explained what happened in the future as the present Saiyans are livid. How dare they? Kakarot is just curious to see how strong they are and isn't as bothered about his body being taken. His families, though? He's furious. Beerus wonders what the true identity of these Saiyan imposters really is, but they have no time to waste. Goku, Vegeta, a healed up Raditz, Bardock, and King Vegeta head to the future. Gine had refused to be left behind, as she wants to stop these monsters from masquerading as herself and her family. The ship is way too cramped, so Bulma pulls out one of her old inventions, her shrinking watch, and shrinks down Goku and Vegeta so they can all fit. Back in the future, things are pretty dire for Trunks and Tarbo, who are on the verge of the feet. They managed to survive this far, but they don't have much longer left. The Black Saiyans thank the filthy mortals as, because of their battles, they have unlocked the peak of their true power. They had begun developing their own form. Super Saiyan Rose. They are currently searching for Trunks and Tarbo as they hide underground. This was actually Tarbo's idea. Inspired by watching the battles between the Super Saiyan gods, King Vegeta and Bardock against Beerus. But once they sense their family in the future, they come back out and join them. It doesn't take long for the Black Saiyans to find them, revealing not only their new form, but their true identity too. Each one of them was once a Kaioshin named Zamazu. After witnessing the Universe 6 tournament on GodTube, Zamazu was upset that these mortals were using the powers of the gods for their own disgusting ways. At first, he only wanted to steal Vegeta's body after seeing Super Saiyan Blue evolution. However, when he did, he was ambushed by various Saiyans on Earth. Vegeta Black narrowly survived the encounter, which made him realize he needed more allies. He stole the time ring and Vegeta Black went to various other timelines, recruiting Samazus and helping them use their own Super Dragon Balls to steal their own Saiyan body. After creating this new dark team of Saiyans, the Samazu adopted the moniker of Black and proceeded to return to each of their own timelines and eradicate their respective Earths, enacting the Zero Mortals plan upon these Saiyans. The Saiyan family had heard enough of this. They didn't care about their little plan, they care about their name being sullied and future Trunks' Earth being doomed. Vegeta and his father, King Vegeta, faced off against their sinister doppelgangers. With a shared nod between father and son, the battle commenced. Vegeta shot forward with a locking fist with Vegeta Black in a fierce airborne tussle. Their blows echoed through the city, each strike causing mini shockwaves. King Vegeta with royal grace launched at King Vegeta Black, their power struggle creating craters with each impact. 
Vegeta unleashed a big bang attack against Vegeta Black, who retaliated with a dark hued version of the final flash. Their energies met in a blinding explosion, decimating several city blocks. King Vegeta unleashed a powerful energy sphere, hurling it towards his counterpart. King Vegeta Black tried to deflect it, not realizing this was just a distraction as King Vegeta appeared in front of him and punched him in the stomach and into his son's beam clash. This surprised Vegeta Black, making him lose the clash, but neither of the doppelgangers were done yet. Meanwhile, Bardock's family confronted their own shadowy versions. Goku and Goku Black clashed in a fierce and fast battle, multiple rebel blasts clashing in the sky. Goku fired something he hadn't used in a while. A Kamehameha, which he learned when he was part of the rebellion on Earth, standing up against King Vegeta. Meanwhile, Bardock tackled Bardock Black, a brutal mix of martial arts and raw Saiyan skill. Tarbo, who had been part of Bardock's dojo at this point, could see Bardock rebel martial arts style reflected in each punch. He was surprised how well it actually worked. Raditz grappled Raditz Black by the hair, launching him up to the sky and firing a blast, while Gine, normally a peaceful soul, faced her own dark version. They chased each other through the city, dashing amongst buildings, leaving trails of key behind them. In a moment of desperation, Bardock and Goku switched opponents. It was the first time in a long time since father and son had faced each other, and it was just as exciting as the first time. But Bardock and Goku placed their hands next to each other, firing a combined rebel spear against their two counterparts. A swirl of blue and green energy, the city trembled as buildings toppled from the sheer force. The black counterparts surged back with renewed fury. It seemed like their power was endless, and the Saiyan heroes began to feel the weight of the relentless assault. Even so, King Vegeta once again spoke up. He needed to be an inspiration for his family, telling them to join forces, that they can do this together. They had defeated all kinds of enemies before, even their own slavers. Now it was time to face their own demons. That's when King Vegeta wiped some blood off his face, his aura opening up once more, revealing Super Saiyan Blue. Bardock Black taunts their foes, as each of the imposters lets them know what they did after stealing these bodies, immediately raising those earths to the ground and killing all of their friends and family. Bardock cursed and followed King Vegeta's move of transforming into Super Saiyan Blue. They were saving this for whatever the next tournament was going to be, as King Vegeta and Bardock had been training together at the Hyperbolic Time Chamber, but there wasn't time for games now. Goku and Bardock pummeled their foes in Super Saiyan Blue, while Gine is pushed to the edge by her own self. She's the weakest of them, and she knows that, but she has never given up on her family. Having spent time training at the dojo with Bardock and King Vegeta, she did some training of her own, her aura bursting open into Super Saiyan. Not only that, it seemed like the emotional toll of having to face her own family had awoken something within her, as another aura burst around her, the aura of a Super Saiyan God. This is similar to Trunks' Super Saiyan Rage, only this one, instead of having the power of the Super Saiyan Blue surrounding it, it has the Super Saiyan God aura, as that was the main power Bardock and King Vegeta had, so that's the one she trained around. This power-up manages to push back Gine Black, who had been taunting Gine about killing her own family. The mere thought of that broke her peaceful heart and awoke in rage. Meanwhile, Trunks sees his father and grandfather getting stabbed through the chest by their own counterparts, awakening his own Super Saiyan Rage state just like the original story. He loses it, declaring that he will become a monster if it means killing them and ridding his universe of them. It pains him to say this though, he doesn't want to hurt his own family, even if they are imposters pretending to be them. Goku and Bardock, drawing from their bond shared between father and son, synchronized their movements perfectly. Goku dashed towards the nearby collapsed skyscraper, using the momentum to launch himself skywards. Bardock did the same from the opposite side, creating a pincer movement. As they reached the apex, they combined their key into a single dazzling energy beam and unleashed it down sending Goku Black and Bardock Black retreating into the distance with a brilliant trail of light. King Vegeta and Vegeta, seeing the opportunity, clashed their fists together, creating a shockwave. This diverted the attention of King Vegeta Black and Vegeta Black, allowing Vegeta to grab a massive steel beam from the ruins and hurl it like a javelin. But Gine and Raditz were struggling against their dark counterparts. The various other Saiyans opened their auras up, pushing the enemies away. The heroes converged on Raditz Black and Gine Black 
determined to eliminate the foes once and for all. Tarbolt darted between pieces of debris, firing rapid key blast to keep Raditz Black off balance. This allowed Trunks, with his sword drawn, to engage him close up, each swing causing Raditz Black to fail more and more. King Vegeta and Vegeta worked in tandem, firing blast and ensuring that Raditz Black could not escape. When his back was against the wall, Vegeta fired a couple of key rings that pinned Raditz against the wall. On the other end, Gine Black faced Bardock, her eyes pleading, calling his name, asking him if he did not recognize his wife. But Bardock's eyes bore into hers, a storm of emotions within him. My Gine would never wreak this havoc, nor harm anyone innocent, he said, his voice cold and firm. Gine Black's demeanor shifted, her face filled with rage as she unleashed a powerful energy wave. But she was caught off guard as the real Raditz and Gine emerged from either side, both of them striking her in the face. With this diversion, Bardock and Goku launched forward, sending Gine against the same wall Raditz was pinned up against. Bardock and Kakarot hated doing this, but they had to defend their world. The other Dark Saiyans zoomed towards them, but it was too late, and they watched as Raditz and Gine Black were finally defeated with a powerful key blast combination of all the Saiyans there. As the screams of Samazu resounded off, our heroes panted, their energy quickly failing them. The remaining Black Saiyans can see that their backs are soon against the wall. It was time for their most desperate technique, each of them removing their Potara in pairs, giving birth to Vegito Black and King Vardog Black. Things look hopeless for the heroes, as the Black Spirit Sword zooms across the plane, causing an explosion that leaves them all separated and hurt, while the King in Black fired a Dark Rebellion Spear that keeps Vegeta and Goku in particular away. However, fueled by rage, two Saiyans begin to rise up again, Trunks and Gine. They were two of the weakest ones there, but for that very reason, Zamasu, with his sense of superiority, didn't pay much attention to them, and they rise. Their auras continue to explode, walking forward and attempting to hold off the foes. As Raditz gets an idea, the Zamasu were able to fuse, because they had earrings, right? What if they had their own? The Saiyans scramble to find the bodies of Gine Black and Raditz Black, taking their Potara and passing them around. Gine and Trunks do what they can, but they prove to be way too much for them. The evil fusions ask if they have any final words, as Gine chuckles and tells them, It's... it's over. You lost. Two pillars of light part the darkness, as Barlot and Emperor Vegeta are born. This is the first time our heroes have fused in this story. The two opposing fusion sides stare each other down, as Vegito Black lets go of Gine and smirks. Once again, mortals trying to become gods, huh? The Potara fusion is only supposed to be for them. Thankfully, the Kaioshin don't have a time limit. The Saiyans will. He'll just have to finish them off while they're fused. It'll be just like killing two birds with one stone. But Barlot just cracks his knuckles. They have no idea what this Potara fusion thing is. But they know that no matter how short their time is, they will defeat them. Emperor Vegeta moved his cape in front of him, lightning spinning on the ground, declaring this battle as their victory. Barlot darted forward, launching a barrage of strikes, each punch and kick accentuated by flashes of Goku's signature moves, merged with the wild fury of Bardock. A rising uppercut followed a spinning elbow reminiscent of Bardock's Tyrant Lancer, but Vegito Black parried. At times, it seems like they were equal, but it was clear that Barlot was a master of martial arts unparalleled, and quickly obtained the upper hand. Meanwhile, Emperor Vegeta and King Vardog Black was a sight to behold. Vegeta launched a Big Bang attack from each hand. The Dark Saiyan countered with a Dark Rebellion trigger, trying to corner the Emperor. Amidst the relentless combat, the Dark Saiyans began synchronizing their attacks, pushing the heroic fusions to the defensive. Trunks, Tarbo, Raditz, and Gine converged, placing their hands forward and pouring their energy into the two fighters, their spirits intertwining with the essence of the fusions. The ground itself began to vibrate, 
Fate and resonate with the combined Saiyan legacy echoing through the cosmos, reality itself shattering like shards of glass just for a few seconds. Emperor Vegeta, drawing from his newfound energy, placed his hands together, a ginormous sword appearing overhead, reminiscent of the Saiyan royal symbol. He called it the Royal Excalibur. It gleamed with a golden brilliance, representing the regal might of his bloodline. But Barlot was not going to be outdone. He prepared to combine the Kamehameha and the Riot Javelin. He created the Riot Kamehameha. With a unified battle cry, Emperor Vegeta charged, slicing through energy waves with his Royal Excalibur. His eyes locked on King of Varlot, slicing across him, sparkles uttering from his body as the fusion was cut in half, splitting in two before Samasu's screams was heard across the world, dissolving into stardust. Meanwhile, the rebellious Barlot appeared right in front of Vegito Black. Barlot launched the Riot Blast, consuming the Zamasu fusion. The two heroic fusions stood side by side as the slash from the Royal Excalibur remained in the future sky and the blast punctuated it, leaving no trace of the Kaioshin behind but the destroyed city and a grim reminder of the lives lost. The two of them turned around to smile at their family who ran in to hug them before the fusions undid themselves. Peace once again returning to the world. Trunks thanked them all for saving his future as Tarbo looks over at the time machine. The younger Saiyan wonders what had become of him in the future. He had been long away from his family, but if he knows himself, then he'll be more than willing to help out this future version of his nephew. He gives Trunks the coordinates to planet Tech Tech. The Tarbol in this timeline could perhaps help Trunks rebuild Earth. After all, we're family. Vegeta and the Bardock families try to comically fit inside of the cramped time machine as everyone returns to the past. Beerus and Whis decide that they're going to visit Samazu after getting told what happened in the future. They'll see if the Zero Mortals plan nonsense will happen here too. Meanwhile, future Mai and future Trunks wave goodbye, returning to their own timeline, vowing to live up to the standards of his father and his grandfather promising to surpass them both and become the leader of the next generation of Saiyans. As a gift, King Vegeta gave something to Trunks, a small patch he had requested from Bulma. Now on one arm, Trunks wore the symbol of Capsule Corp, and on the other, the Saiyan Royal Symbol. A reminder, he is not only a human, but a Saiyan. It's a bittersweet goodbye, as Trunks knows there is so much work to do, but it'll all be worth it in the end because he knows he can count on his family if anything happens again. And so, this dark chapter in our hero's story comes to a close. Time passes since the defeat of the evil Saiyans, with Goku and Vegeta training hard out of Beerus' planet alongside Whis, when suddenly Beerus gets called up by Zeno. Goku, Vegeta, and Raditz continue training, while Whis and Beerus go to see what's up. The Lord above all reveals that he is now ready to begin a so-called Tournament of Power. Beerus thinks this could be interesting, and a cool way to see just how far his students have evolved. But his enthusiasm fades once he learns that the losers of the tournament and their respective universes will get erased from existence. They have very little time to gather fighters, and Beerus panics. When he returns to his planet, he immediately tells Goku and the others what was going on. But Goku reassures them, they'll be okay. They'll be able to win no sweat. Thus, Raditz, Vegeta, and Goku go around finding candidates for the upcoming tournament. They'll need 10 warriors for Universe 7's team. When Goku approaches his family at Bardock's dojo with news about the tournament, they are eager to step up to the challenge and defend the universe. Goku isn't sure if it's a good idea to tell everyone about the consequences if they lose, but Bardock tells him that this is going to be the biggest motivator. Time and time again, when Earth was threatened with sure destruction, that's when the true heroes stepped up to the challenge. Goku is convinced, and he challenges his parents and Android 16 to a 3v1 match to determine just how strong they are. And sure enough, Goku is astounded with their strength, especially 16 and his mother. He knew how strong Bardock was, but the other two had improved immensely. As a reminder, Android 16 in this story isn't fully mechanical, but instead a cyborg similar to Androids 17 and 18. He is capable of growing his power naturally through hard work and training. 
After training intensely with the guidance of Bardock for many years, 16 has become much more powerful and capable of even pushing Goku to his max. Gine herself was also very strong, impressing Goku with her Super Saiyan Rage-like state. He never did have time to see it much for himself, but he sees that it has pushed her to powers similar to future Trunks's. Gine reveals that the recent battles against Zamazu, along with her transformation, reawakened her fighting spirit. She has been training with Bardock daily ever since in the Gravity Chamber at Capsule Corp. She still wasn't the biggest fan of it, but she realized that what she didn't like about being part of Bardock's squad was taking over planets. Defending her world? That could be cool. Goku realizes that this was why Bardock never went to Beerus' planet. He was happy training his wife. They are happier and closer than ever as the couple blushes. Gine wonders who else her son's going to get and Bardock realizes something. This is the perfect chance to bring some friends over. Bardock had always had a close eye on Android 17 and after the Cell games he became one of his first students. At first, Goku wanted Piccolo, Vegeta and Android 16 to join, however, they all refused. Android 16 wanted to protect Earth during the tournament, just in case any harm would befall it, while the planet's defenders were gone. As for Piccolo and Vegeta, they were protectors of the Briefs family and the husband of Bulma respectively. They refused to leave Bulma's side while she was pregnant. Vegeta was especially reluctant to join as he wanted to be present for his daughter's birth, but thanks to Whis, she was brought into the world without any issues. This changes Vegeta's mind, but Piccolo still turns down the tournament. He would guard the Briefs family no matter what, and he wanted to take care of Bulma while Vegeta was gone. This Piccolo is much different than the one we know in canon, of course, and has been pretty much raised by Capsule Corp ever since he was born, so he decides to stay. Goku understood, with Vegeta himself entrusting Piccolo with the safety of his family. With the clock ticking and no more ideas left, who would the final member of Universe 7 be? Goku wonders if he should invite Roshi, Tien, Grandpa Gohan and the others, but he decides to talk to his parents about this first. Bardock actually has a very good idea on who to call, and with Whis's help, the father and son travel to Planet Serial in the blink of an eye. Goku wasn't sure where they were, but it quickly dawned on him who Bardock was thinking about, as they find Monaito and Granola. They quickly explain the situation, and Granola instantly accepts. After all, the fate of the universe is at stake, and besides that, Granola wanted to be free from Bardock's debt for saving his life. After they win the tournament, they'll be even. Bardock smirks, shaking his hand as he promises to honor this deal. Thus, the Universe 7 roster consists of Goku, Gohan, Granola, Bardock, Raditz, Gine, King Vegeta, Vegeta, Tarbol, and Android 17. And so, everyone on Universe 7's team gathers together at Capsule Corp. Gine sees newborn baby Bra and smiles. She is adorable, and remarks that she misses holding a baby in her arms, as Bardock gets nervous, and instantly reminds her that they have a granddaughter. Gine gets excited and flies over to her. As everyone huddles together, Beerus makes an announcement. Given the circumstances, he believes a team captain is necessary. At first, Bardock suggests King Vegeta, since he did so well in the battles against Majin Buu. However, in a surprising move that no one saw coming, the king refuses. Instead, he suggests Bardock be the captain. Bardock asks if he's sure, and he nods. The king and Bardock had been at odds with each other for many years. But now, they've gone from bitter rivals to good friends and allies. King Vegeta leads the Saiyans on Earth, but Bardock should lead Universe 7. However, King Vegeta smirks, as he reminds Bardock that should he ever prove to show himself unworthy, he'll be more than willing to step up to the role of leader. Bardock snickers, as he and King Vegeta shake hands. With the team set, everyone prepares to go to the tournament grounds. Gine goes up to Bardock and whispers something in his ear that makes him go beat red. Goku wonders what she said, as Gine tells him not to mind it. It was just something to motivate his father. In a way, King Vegeta felt like, once again, he was making up for his sins past. He sees all these war Warriors, the androids, the humans, the Saiyans. He's made many friends along the way. It was almost as if he had started a new Planet Vegeta, except not everyone was a Saiyan. And even if they weren't all Saiyans, they were Saiyans in spirit. But he wonders, there was one Saiyan he betrayed long ago. Maybe if things go well after the tournament, he would have to make amends once more. 
Beerus puts a hand on King Vegeta's shoulder. Beerus had hoped that the training would have been finished prior to the Tournament of Power, but the king just wasn't there yet. He was powerful and determined, but he was past his prime. Even so, Beerus is proud of how much he had changed. Vegeta and Kakarot were surprised to hear this. They didn't know he had been actively training with Beerus. The king simply pushed his cape off and smirked. It's true that he's been cooking for a while, but the dish isn't ready yet. Goku and Vegeta watched him walk, knowing that they were ready for the tournament. At the World of Void, Team Universe 7 gauges their opponents. With the exception of Universe 6, most of the teams don't seem too impressive, until they notice the blazing heat radiating from Universe 11, Jiren the Grey. King Vegeta asks what Bardock thinks, as the team captain gulps. It being their best interest to avoid him as much as possible. But before Bardock could share this with the rest of the team, Goku was already approaching Jiren and challenging him to a battle. Raditz and Bardock had to drag Goku away as Jiren ignores them. In his eyes, he viewed those Saiyans as weaklings. The tournament of power begins as Gohan asks Bardock what they should do. Bardock smirks. That's easy. Just don't get knocked off the ring. Every Saiyan except for Tarbo leaps forward, heading off into multiple directions. Gohan had been one of the first ones to jump in, as in this universe he takes on a lot after his father. Gohan and Granola group up. They would hold the line and provide support for their teammates. If they get into any danger, Universe 9 attempts to surround Goku and eliminate him right from the start. However, they are blasted away by Raditz as he declares that he won't allow anyone to hurt his little brother. He asks Goku if he likes some help as he grins. He wouldn't mind a tag team against these guys. One by one, Universe 9 fell. Even their greatest fighters, the Trio of the Dangers, were unable to resist the combined might of the greatest Saiyan brothers. In nearly an instant, Universe 9 was eliminated. King Vegeta and his sons soon came in contact with the Universe 6 Saiyans. Kaba is honored to meet his master once again, as Khalifla blurts out loud that she wants to challenge them. King Vegeta recognizes the last one, Kale. She had been the Saiyan that tried to steal things from them back in Planet Sadala. Maybe it was time to teach her a lesson. She was surprisingly timid. Khalifla yelled at King Vegeta not to talk that way to Kale, as she said that the king in her world was a weak punk. She bets that she could take this king on too. King Vegeta chuckles, amused at the girl's spirit. The royal family obliges as they pick their opponents. King Vegeta vs. Khalifla, Vegeta vs. Kale, and Tarbo vs. Kaba. Tarbo and Kaba are very respectful to one another, bowing before their fight. The pair notice how similar their moves and even their temperament are. If their circumstances were different, they would have enjoyed chatting with each other rather than fighting. Maybe he can visit Planet Sadala too. King Vegeta was pacing himself, impressed with Khalifa's stance and strikes. She was very talented. He wished he had more Saiyans like her in his universe. If he had, then maybe Saiyans wouldn't have fallen to Frieza. Vegeta was having the least amount of fun, annoyed at Kale's amateurish movements. She clearly wasn't very confident in her own power or abilities. King Vegeta orders his sons to take things up a notch and the three burst into Super Saiyan. Kaba and Khalifla respond in return, bursting with their own golden auras. However, Kale was unable to reach the same state. In fact, she was no longer focused on the battle at all. She just watched Khalifla and King Vegeta's battle. She had never seen Khalifla be this excited before. Why couldn't she make her this happy? Vegeta's annoyance morphed into anger as he yelled at Kale to focus on the fight at hand. Did she think her pathetic fighting style would ever impress her friend? If she can't even become a Super Saiyan, then she stands no chance. Vegeta's words strike a chord with Kale as she clutches her chest. Kale snaps, bulking up and unleashing a truly terrifying power. King Vegeta and Tarbo stop their fight to watch in horror, asking himself if this was the true legendary Super Saiyan. For some reason, sensing that power and seeing those eyes, he was reminded of a Saiyan child long ago, one he had sent away. As Kale rampages mindlessly, releasing energy blasts that eliminated warriors left and right, she makes contact with King Vegeta, screaming out that it's his fault. Kale charges at the king, who has no choice but to resort to transforming into Super Saiyan Blue simply to stand a chance. Vegeta and Tarbo jump into Super Saiyan Blue as well to help their father. The attack of the Saiyans catches the attention of Jiren, who, without much effort, knocks out the rampaging Kale. This scares the rest of the universe's fighters, but only motivates Goku and Vegeta to aim for Jiren himself. Meanwhile, Bardock and Gine face off against the Kamikaze Fireballs of Universe 2, led by Ribrian. They proclaim themselves to be the protectors of love across the multiverse. Gine appreciates their enthusiasm, but Bardock facepalms. He thought they were really dumb. 
Ribrienne is furious at Bardock's comments as she and her teammates lunge at the pair of Saiyans. Universe 2 was impressive, but they couldn't hold a candle to Bardock and Guinea's unparalleled teamwork. They were completely in sync with each other, almost as if they knew what they were thinking. Most of Universe 2 is eliminated as Ribrienne remains. She's furious, demanding to know how this was possible as Guinea smiles, looking at Bardock warmly, asking if it isn't obvious. It's because he's her husband and they love each other. It's as simple as that. Bardock blushes, but Ribrienne cocks her head. Love? Really? With that guy? He seems gross and ugly. Bardock gulps nervously, looking over at his wife, as he warns Ribrienne that she should get out of here while she can. Gine bursts her aura, entering her Super Saiyan rage state as she roars. How dare she insult her husband like that? Without much issue, Gine beats Ribrienne, as she's finally knocked off the ring. So, that really was true love. Thus, Universe 2 is eliminated, but Ribrienne tells her that she's rooting for her and her love. Back to the Universe 6 Saiyans, they're struggling against the overwhelming might of the Pride Troopers. It seems like they were about to be knocked out. However, at the last moment, Vegeta shouts, asking Kaol if she's really fine with letting things end like this. At the same time, Kaba is struggling against the oppressive force known as Mona from Universe 4, as Kaba fires a Gallic gun to blow away his foe. He realizes that it's not enough. Is this the end of the line for him? That's when Tarbo steps up. You can't give up now, Kaba. What happened to your Saiyan spirit, huh? Vegeta and my father showed us what it meant to be Saiyans. We can't let them down. Let's do this together. Tarbol jumps in, joining Kaba with his very own Gallic gun. With his encouragement reigniting the passion for their people, Kaba awakens Super Saiyan 2, and together, their virtuous Saiyans defeat Mona, eliminating Universe 4. Kale slowly gains control of her berserker state, and together with Khalifla, they turn the tides of battle, eliminating most of Universe 11. Vegeta looks on in pride, walking away as King Vegeta and Bardock approach the girls. Tarbo walks towards Kaba with a smile, it was time for them to finally witness their Saiyan resolve for themselves. The final battle between the Saiyans is about to begin. Kale with her mastered Super Saiyan and Khalifla with her recently discovered Super Saiyan 2 were a sight to behold, but what was more impressive was their unbreakable bond. King Vegeta and Bardock had to release more power, cycling from Super Saiyan to Super Saiyan 2 and finally Super Saiyan God. Khalifla was stunned, excited at the next level of Super Saiyan, as she and Kale fired a combined attack. King Vegeta and Bardock unleashed their power, combining their Gallic Gun and Riot Javelin together into a single beam that pushed the girl's beam back. Kaba himself was doing much better, with Tarbo admitting that he probably couldn't do anything to him if he were to use Super Saiyan 2. However, he had something Kaba didn't, a tail. With his tail, Tarbo is able to grab onto Kaba's leg and knock him off balance, giving him an opportunity for one clean punch. The Universe 6 Saiyans are launched into the void, but not before the royal family declares that they will use the Super Dragon Balls to bring them back to life. Kaba, Khalifla, and Kale thank the Saiyans for their battles before they are erased. Elsewhere, Gohan and Granola continue to provide support as much as possible to their teammates. With Granola's impeccable eyesight, he would instruct Gohan where to aim and shoot Ki Blast in order to strike his enemy's most vital points. They were stellar, eliminating opponents left and right. Not even invisible or tiny foes could hide from Granola's eye. Seventeen was asked to bring up his android barrier, which Granola used to deflect his own Ki Blast, catching countless opponents off guard with impossible yet devastating trick shots which knocked them off of the ring. However, this catches the attention of the enigmatic Hit and the Namekians of Universe 6, forcing the trio into the defensive. Granola was able to predict Hit's time-skip moves by seeing the slightest twitches of his body the moment the assassin attempted to move, launching counterattacks before Time Stop was even activated. This intrigued Hit, distracting him for long enough for Seventeen to charge in with a knee to the face. He would be his opponent now. This gave Gohan and Granola much-needed breathing room, which they needed to focus in on the Universe 6 Namekians. With a combined Kamehameha and a precise finger sniper shot, however, Seventeen wasn't doing nearly as good. Hit's time skip was advancing further and further with every passing second, yet no matter how hard he struck a vital point, Seventeen always stood back up. Hit reveals his ultimate technique, the time cage. 
Seventeen was rendered motionless, unable to move. Gohan and Granola tried to save Seventeen, but they weren't able to move past Hit's time stop. Gohan saves Granola from a vital strike, taking the attack as his eyes white out before getting launched off the ring. While in the moment, without even thinking about his own safety, Granola leaped towards the edge of the ring and grabbed Gohan's arm at the last moment. Hit approaches Seventeen as he prepares to kick the cyborg off of the ring. However, Hit instead is kicked away by none other than Goku, glowing in the ethereal glow of Super Saiyan Blue. Goku uses his godly energy to destroy the time cage as he lifts up 17, apologizing for getting here late, but the cyborg merely chuckles. Who would have thought the man he was created to kill would save him like this? 17 and Goku stood back to back, charging towards Hit with their fists outstretched. Hit was already struggling with 17 before. With Goku here now, he didn't stand a chance. In a final dual punch to the gut, Goku and 17 knocked out Hit as the assassin was eliminated. Goku Goku gives a thumbs up to Seventeen and Granola, thanking them for saving Gohan. He asks them to watch Gohan's back as he leaves towards the next battle. Seventeen smiles as he lifts up Gohan from the ground. Granola mentions that he still can't believe how nonchalant and trusting Goku is of people that tried to kill him before, but Seventeen shrugs. You'll get used to it. Now hurry up, we have a lot of catching up to do. During an intense battle against Jiren, Goku is able to awaken the mysterious state known as Ultra Instinct, similarly to the original story. However, it wasn't the spirit bomb that did it this time. Instead, it was the use of his own father's Raya Javelin, which Jiren bounced back and Goku was consumed by. However, this power wasn't nearly enough as he was beaten down by the strongest Pry Trooper. Raditz and Gine rescued Goku, protecting him from any incoming threats while he recovered his stamina. The machines of Universe 3 combined into the gigantic Anilaza. He was a strong foe, but 17 rose up to the challenge, asking for help from his teammates as the Saiyans nod, bursting into the strongest forms and launching themselves at Anilaza, distracting him. The giant was so preoccupied with the group attack that he never noticed someone approaching his foot. Using all of his strength, Seventeen lift up the fusion and threw him into the void, eliminating Universe 3. Now all that remained was Universe 7 and the three strongest pride troopers of Universe 11, Jiren the Grey, the speedster Dispo, and their leader Topo. The last battle for the fate of the universe is kicked off with a roar from Bardock as he launched a riot javelin straight at Jiren's face. However, the blast is reflected with a simple gaze from the hero's eyes. Universe 7 splits up to divide and conquer. Android 17, Granola and Gohan vs Dispo, King Vegeta, Tarbo, Bardock, Ikine, and Raditz vs Topo, Gohan and Vegeta vs Jiren. Dispo is in incredibly fast, as it becomes clear to the Z fighters that the only way to stop him is by restricting his movements. Granola has a plan, requesting Seventeen and Gohan to buy him time to prepare as they nod. As Seventeen and Gohan do their best to occupy Dispo, Granola creates a field of floating key mines scattering across the ring. Then he closes his eyes as he gathers his energy, focusing all of it into his eyes and fingertips. Dispo is beating on Gohan, but he is grappled by Seventeen and dunked into the ring, creating a massive crater. At that moment, Granola opens his eyes, revealing that both of them have become red. Granola yells out, NOW! As he fires a charged finger beam, Dispo manages to vibrate his hand and break free from Seventeen's grip. However, instead of missing, the finger beam collides with the key mine Granola left behind. The beam suddenly jerks and changes direction right towards Dispo. Using the minefield of key as mirrors, Granola was using them to reflect and redirect his finger blast. The rabbit tries to outrun the finger beam as much as he can, however Dispo failed to realize that he was now being led even deeper into the minefield. With a key minefield all around him and the devastating key blast reflecting, he was trapped. The finger blast strikes Dispo as he attempts to block it with his hands. Gohan rises up, firing his own riot javelin as it lands squarely on Dispo's as he is blasted away, eliminated from the tournament. Meanwhile, Topo does his best to hold off the incoming Saiyan threat. He recognizes the Saiyans as valiant warriors. The King and Bardock recognize that Topo is incredibly powerful. They don't know if they can actually defeat him, even with their Super Saiyan Blue, but they have to try. The Z Fighters do their best, but Topo is just too strong. Gohan, Seventeen, and Granola arrive to provide support, with Topo telling them to come at him. However, Topo unleashes more of his power, which cracks the arena around him. Tarbo attempts to blast Topo away, but he is slapped out of Super Saiyan Blue, falling into the abyss. Android 17 was the next to follow, as his barrier cracked under Topo's mighty fist. 
Granola thinks he has enough energy to try one more finger beam. Super Saiyan Blue, Bardock and Topo are locked in a grappling contest in an attempt to overpower each other with brute force. Topo commends Bardock for his immense bravery in light of overwhelming odds, but that it's not enough. Topo breaks Bardock's grip and starts crushing him in a bear hug. The other Z fighters try to fire their own blast, but Topo tanks them all, unwilling to let Bardock go. Once you are defeated, the rest shall fall. However, Bardock refuses to give up. Flashing through various moments of his life, he sees the founding of the dojo, the defeat of Frieza, the birth of Raditz and Kakarot, as he then sees Gine smile from the moment they first met. With his Saiyan spirit igniting, Bardock undergoes a new transformation, breaking free from Topo as his hair turns into a deeper shade of blue. Bardock has evolved the Super Saiyan Blue state to a new height. Vegeta smirks. Him and Kakarot's old man had always been similar to each other. He burst into Super Saiyan Blue evolution as well. Two Saiyans from different generations and from different families uniting with this one purpose. This was the power Samazu feared. The power of the Saiyans evolving the strength of the gods. Bardock rallies his teammates, regrouping as they lead a charge on Topo. While Bardock takes care of Topo, the rest of the team will blast away the ring around them until their foe has nowhere else to run. The plan works, as Topo and Bardock find themselves on the shattered edge of the ring. Topo declares that he cannot be defeated here. He is carrying the burning pride of the pride troopers. Bardock retorts by saying that he can't afford to lose either. He has the pride of his family and the entire Saiyan race with him, and he cannot let them down. The two warriors punch each other square in the face, staggering back. No one is sure who will fall first. Topo mumbles congratulating Bardock on a job well done as the leader of the Pride Troopers falls off the ring. King Vegeta catches Bardock before he falls, commending him for honoring their race. All that remains now is Jiren, but he is easily the strongest foe they had ever faced. Even with Super Saiyan Blue, Goku and Vegeta can no longer push back against the hero, even if he is impressed by the evolved state. The remnants of Universe 7, consisting of Gohan, Granola, Gine, Bardock, Raditz, and King Vegeta, arrive to lend their aid. However, even their max power cannot defeat Jiren the Grey. Out of everyone here, it was Bardock in his newly discovered Super Saiyan Blue evolution that could pierce his defenses alongside Vegeta. But Jiren roars, releasing a massive wave of blazing hot ki around the area. The fighters are blasted back, with Gine, Granola, and Raditz nowhere to be seen. From the rubble, Vegeta and King Vegeta stand together, getting into a royal-style battle stance. Using whatever remaining energy they had, despite their excellent teamwork and movements, it was reduced to nothing before Jiren. The Grey Sentinel defeats the father and son duo with a single blast. The Vegetas pass off their remaining energy to their saviors. Goku and Bardock open their eyes, Stardust filling the air. As the strongest father and son duo in history rise up once more, Goku in Ultra Instinct Omen and Bardock in Super Saiyan Blue Evolution. Jiren motions for them to come as their final battle resumes. While Goku dodges Jiren's strikes, Bardock attacks. However, Jiren bulks up into his full power mode. He launches a ruthless counterattack, pummeling them with eye key eyes. Jiren finishes the combo by launching a massive key ball. Bardock alone tries to push back the ball, but his own key blast can't do anything to repel it. Bardock closes his eyes, ready to accept his fate, but Goku leaps forward, pushing his father away as he's consumed by the blast as universe 7 loses hope even bardock feels hopeless yet gine appears behind her husband as she yells that bardock needs to stand back up if there was anything bardock had taught her in this life it's that a saiyan never gives up until the very end raditz and gohan appear as well urging bardock to fight on bardock smiles as he gets back on his feet despite not having energy to go even super saiyan bardock retorts that he and his family will never surrender let's win this together. A galaxy of stars suddenly appear as the ethereal glow mastered Ultra Instinct Goku envelops that of the remaining arena. The entire Bardock family stands together before Jiren. Now this was a final battle. Goku rose right before falling from the ring, awakening this new state. Goku's attacks were now really starting to hurt, but more than that, the image of a family standing together despite overwhelming odds hits a chord within the giant's soul. The pride troopers speak up yelling at Jiren to win this for all of them. Jiren was their hero, the Pride Troopers were his family. Feeling renewed vigor and hope, Jiren makes one final stand against the remnants of Universe 7. But it was Raditz that shouted at everyone to dogpile Jiren. They had to capitalize on Jiren's weakened state. It was now or never. Everyone in the family nods. Goku, Bardock and Gine tackled Jiren, 
followed by Gohan, then Raditz. They were running on fumes, but the greatest Saiyan family manages to ignite their spirits, flickering into Super Saiyan one final time. Jiren was unable to overcome the burning resolve of this family, merely muttering that this must be the power of trust as the Saiyans tackle him off of the ring. From one floating piece of debris, Granola came out of hiding. Granola was granted the title of MVP by the Grand Priest, who then asked him what he wanted to wish for with the Dragon Balls. Granola was quiet for a moment, his head racing with thoughts. This was his moment, his one and only chance to not only revive his mother, but the rest of the Cerulean's as well. But then he thought of Goku, Bardock, and everyone else. He remembered Bardock's promise, and he smiled. Without skipping a beat, Granola wished for all other universes to be restored. And just like that, life returned to the multiverse. Bardock smiled as Granola approached his team. He had kept this promise. Now they would be even. The Universe 6 Saiyans approached the Universe 7 ones, telling them just how excited they were to fight them again. Perhaps they could visit their own home planet this time. King Vegeta spoke up, saying that they're welcome to Earth anytime. That's where the Saiyans of Universe 7 live. That's their home world. Team Universe 7 returned. Gine smiled happily as she whispered to Bardock that it was time for his reward. But as it turns out, what Gine had promised was an enormous feast. Everyone from Universe 7 and their friends from across the world and the universe come to eat together. After the party, King Vegeta approached Bardock just as he was getting ready to go. King Vegeta asked Bardock if he remembers what they did a few years back, going around the universe and saving planets from the Freezer rule. There was one planet he wanted to visit that he didn't get to during that time. A long time ago, there was a young Saiyan I was afraid of. Fighting the Universe 6 Saiyans, I was reminded of him, that kale girl. The look in her eyes looked familiar. I realize now, there is one more Saiyan of our generation that may still be around, with his own son. Tell me, Bardock, do you remember Paragus? I'm sure it's too late to make amends, but if there's a chance, we can expand our family and continue giving the Saiyan race one more chance. Will you come with me to search for that boy? He wasn't sure. It was ridiculous. Surely that Broly kid and Paragus would be dead by now, but if there was any chance any Saiyans remained, then he would take it. It was clear through King Vegeta's eyes that this was the final sin he was ashamed of. Bardock nodded at King Vegeta as he turned to Gine and told her that he'd be back, that he has one more adventure. But not before Raditz, Goku, Vegeta, and told him to wait. They were coming along too. They were speaking relatively loud. If King Vegeta was afraid of him, then surely this guy must be crazy strong. King Vegeta couldn't help but smile. The Saiyan Kingdom remained. And soon enough, they would add a new member. King Vegeta, Vegeta, Bardock, Raditz, and Goku all travel together to planet Vampa. Vegeta doubts they'll even still be alive. They land and use a new Capsule Corp scouter to try and detect the power level of the people. They just find a giant green creature, and King Vegeta is startled by it, shooting one of them to make it go away. But this was a mistake. Suddenly, the scouter begins to beep rapidly. Something is incoming. The king is slammed into a wall by a powerful punch. Vegeta curses and instantly jumps into Super Saiyan, rushing towards the assailant. Vegeta begins battling Broly, as Paragus runs out of the cave to see what's going on, and he can't believe his eyes. The king? He looks around. More Saiyans. Why had they come here? It was the perfect time for revenge, but Broly continued to fight the prince. With Bardock and Goku joining in, Broly is brought down to his knees, but begins to explode more and more in power until finally the king speaks up. Enough. That's him. He is the boy we came looking for. Broly continues to huff and puff, but the king takes slow steps towards him. Broly, right? I do not mean to disturb you. I've come here looking for your father. Broly's eyes were full of rage, ready to snap at any moment, but Paragus stands up. You have guts showing your face after what you did to us, king. Explain yourself before I allow him to kill you. What the hell did you do to him? We were afraid of his power, of what it represented. No Saiyan was meant to be stronger than Vegeta. I was a fool and cast him away. I see now that Broly could have helped us defeat Freeze. Paragus is insulted still, so he just thinks of Broly as a useful tool? King Vegeta denied this. That's why they have come here. King Vegeta knew there was a possibility that these two Saiyans were still alive. All he wanted now was to offer them a place to live. What few Saiyans remain now live on Earth, with new families. Training daily, Paragus was in disbelief. He thinks about it. A chance to live a real life. A chance to give Broly a future. That could be a great chance. Bardock then pulled out a capsule full of tables of food. Delicious food from Guinea. This made Paragus and Broly's stomach growl. Reluctantly, Paragus agreed. They had a small feast. 
leaving nearly nothing left. However, Gine also packed a lot of extra food, knowing so many Saiyans would be there. Paragus and Broly enjoyed it a lot, though Broly ate less than the others, as he was not used to food that was actually seasoned and cooked well. It was just weird to him. Through the meal, Bardock and the King explained much about their adventures, and Broly was mesmerized. Planet Vegeta blowing up, the training on Earth, and the fight against Frieza, gods of destruction, it seemed so fantastical. Paragus didn't believe any of it. With just a little bit of dessert left, Bardock packed away the capsule full of food. On the way to the ship, Kakarot, Raditz, and Vegeta all talked to Broly, who was very awkward but nice. Too nice. Vegeta wasn't even sure if he was really a Saiyan. Raditz teased him a little bit, telling him that maybe they could have an exhibition match to entertain the people of Earth. Paragus was quiet, and though the king attempted to talk to him, all he would respond with was cold glares. Bardock, on the other hand, was just insulted. Why did Bardock get to survive while Paragus lived in squalor? As they entered the ship and took off, Paragus began with his plan. As the Saiyans settled down in the ship, Paragus whispered to Broly to attack. Broly was confused. They were saving them. But Paragus insisted, and Broly cared nothing more than about his father. In an instant, while Bardock and the others were off guard, Broly burst forward, grabbing Vegeta and Goku by the face and slamming them into a wall. King Vegeta asked what the hell was going on, but Paragus responded by firing multiple blasts. The King and Bardock easily avoided them, and Raditz snapped forward, punching Paragus in the gut. Broly saw this as Goku and Vegeta struggled to get out of his grasp, and they were both thrown out at Raditz. Paragus, reeling in pain, realized that perhaps this wasn't the greatest idea. He didn't know the length of their power and just assumed that Broly could take them on easily. The ship was still in the planet's atmosphere, with Goku and the others avoiding Broly as much as they could. But Broly's anger continued to rise further and further, firing a giant blast at Goku that sent him through the spaceship wall. The ship began to break apart, falling quickly down to the planet as Goku finally burst into Super Saiyan God alongside Vegeta, with Broly following them out of the ship. Inside, Bardock tried to pilot the ship, but it was clear that there was little they could do. Without an option, King Vegeta grabbed onto Paragus and rushed out of there, followed by Bardock and Raditz. The spaceship exploded as it crashed down, while Goku, Vegeta, and Broly continued to battle. Paragus slapped King Vegeta's hand away as they landed. Now they were stuck there. What could they do? If they were doomed to stay on this planet, then at at least they will kill them first. Paragus encouraged Broly to keep fighting, that they were doomed either way. Bardock grabbed Paragus by the collar and shook him, calling him a moron, that they were saving them. Was revenge really worth their lives? Paragus sped at the ground. He wanted to leave, yes, but he couldn't forgive the king. Bardock was angry, way too angry, and punched Paragus across the face, instantly knocking him out. Bardock yelled at Goku and Vegeta, telling them that they need to figure out a way to get home and to stop playing with Broly. But as he said this, Broly's attention was drawn to his father. In an instant, Broly felt his heart sink. He thought these people were trying to help them, but perhaps his father was right. Was he dead? His father was his only responsibility. He couldn't be. Broly exploded in deep rage, unleashing Super Saiyan. This surprised Goku and Vegeta, who weren't sure why this was happening. They realized that Broly couldn't sense Ki and didn't know his father was still alive. They tried to tell him this, but there was no way to convince him. Without much of a choice, Raditz burst into Super Saiyan Blue and joined the battle. The planet began to shake as Bardock and the King discussed options, but they couldn't think of anything to get them out of there. If only there was a way to communicate with Whis. That's when Bardock got an idea. He clicked open the capsule with some food left and lifted one of them up, calling out for Beerus and Whis. They continued to try over and over again until finally Whis answered the call. He always had a bit of an eye out for the Saiyans. Beerus wasn't thrilled about having to help them get to Earth, but seeing the fight in the background interested him. The gods agreed to help them out, but it would take around 30 minutes. Bardock cursed. They would need to distract Broly and try to wake up Paragus in the meantime. Broly's power was incredible, and it created shockwaves through the planet. Raditz was starting to struggle little by little. A rogue blast from Broly's mouth took him down to the ground as the monster Saiyan followed him, with Vegeta and Goku trying to get him off of him. Bardock burst forward to help, kicking Broly in the face and finally pushing him away as the king appeared above to fire a royal blast. Broly was proving to be too much of a problem, even with all the Saiyans helping. Raditz was far too hurt. Even Goku and Vegeta were starting to tire out. The King and Bardock continued to fight alongside their sons as Broly broke out of his armor and began to show even more incredible power. Reality seemed to start to break apart. All of the Saiyans were left broken and battered as Broly rose above, the planet shaking and threatening to explode. They had nothing left they could do. Paragus slowly began to come back to consciousness, his vision unblurring little by little, only to fight his son. No, not a monster, but a devil. He quickly reached for the remote 
and press the button down only for the electricity to not only not affect Broly, but to also realize that Broly's collar had exploded a long time ago. They were doomed. Paragus didn't know what to do, as his son continued to gather more and more power. The Saints mustered their last bit of strength to stand up to him, but Paragus ran in front of them. His arms spread wide open. Broly, listen to me. That's enough. If you destroy the planet, you'll kill us too. I'm alive, don't you see? Broly was inconsolable, however, and with one final roar, he fired a blast from his mouth. Paragus was terrified, afraid of his own son. They all gasped. But Paragus's death did not arrive. Instead, he opened his eyes to see King Vegeta attempting to push back the blast. It was proving to be too much, as the others began to fire their own attacks at Broly. Vegeta told his father to get out of there, but his father continued to push back. He trembled in and out of Super Saiyan Blue as he whispered to his son, There is more to our power. More we can achieve. King Vegeta's aura blinked slowly into a purple one his hair shining the same color for what it seemed to be just a few moments. Broly's blast began to be pushed back and back until Broly was finally consumed by his own attack. It took the strength of all of the Saiyans there, but at least they were still alive. Broly was knocked into a mountain and it seemed like he too was nearly out for the count. Bardock and the others looked at the king, amazed at what looked to be a new form, only for the king to fall back and onto Paragus. Paragus caught him and laid him down, with Vegeta running to his side. Bardock and his sons continued towards Broly, fighting back. King Vegeta's ki was fading away. Paragus asked him why he did that. He could have just let him die. Vegeta swore to defeat Broly. But King Vegeta spoke up. Enough Saiyan blood has been shed. I came here to save our people, not to kill more of them. My son, save them. Paragus was left speechless, while Vegeta simply looked at his father as he passed away. Vegeta didn't say a word as he stood up. Looking up at Bardock, Kakarot, and Raditz fighting Broly, his blue aura enveloped him one last time. Vegeta joined the other Saiyans as finally from behind a flash of light appeared. Beerus and Whis. They were perplexed to see the king dead, but amazed at the power displayed by all involved. Paragus realized then that he really was in the presence of deities. The stories the king told were in fact true. Vegeta told the others to follow his lead. They rushed at Broly all together. Vegeta in the middle, Kakarot on the left, Raditz on the right, and Bardock behind them. Bardock swung a half-moon key blast that caught Broly against the rock formation, giving the other three a chance to zoom forward. Fist pulled back and full of whatever little power they had left. The roar of an Ozaru was heard. To Broly, it even seemed like the great ape's mouth was about to devour him. As the three punches crossed, bursting into starlight. Broly was finally blown away. His body fell from the sky above and to the ground as Vegeta caught him and landed him by his father. Broly opened his eyes to see Paragus holding him. Father? You don't have to keep fighting, Broly. We will be safe. I'm sorry. Broly's eyes then shifted to Beerus, who smirked. If that power could be controlled, he would be something special. Vegeta stood before his father's body as Kakarot placed a hand on his shoulder. He showed you something before he died, didn't he? A power he had been working on for a while. He wanted to use it in a fight against you, Prince. One last fight. Vegeta turned to Beerus, so there really was something beyond. Beerus had been training with the king to do that. One last hurrah for the old king. Vegeta looked up to the sky. It's time to return home. Paragus Broly, you're coming with us. We will find you a place to stay. Paragus was afraid of the prince. Why was he not trying to kill them? Was he really trying to honor his father's final wish? Indeed, he was. Whis and Beerus would then take the Saiyans home. Their families grieved at the king's passing, but Vegeta was surprisingly calm. Paragus and Broly moved into a house close to Capsule Corp, though Broly would spend most of his time with Beerus and Whis. Once they all settled and their families were together, with Gine, Gohan, Goten, Trunks, Piccolo, Tarbo, and the others, they heard a voice. Glad to see you are all well. Father! I am in other worlds, my friends. There is many strange beings here, including someone known as King Kai, a lesser god than Kaioshin, but with some interesting abilities. We can gather the Dragon Balls and- I have already been brought back once before. My time has passed, but that is okay. Earth has been a welcoming home, but I am afraid I have cheated death far too many times. Everyone stayed quiet and sad, but not Bardock, he understood. But remember, there are other Dragon Balls out there. I won't be away forever. Help Broly and Paragus. Ensure the Saiyan spirits will live on. 
I leave it to you, King Vegeta. Father! The king's voice faded, but it left them with a hopeful spirit for the future. They all turned to look at Vegeta, who simply smiled. He wasn't the sentimental type. So instead, he just looked at Raditz, Broly, Kakarot, and Tarbo. He cracked his knuckles and burst out of there. The others followed. As Goten and Trunks cheered them on, Bardock crossed his arms. The king and Bardock knew their time was up for quite a while now, so he would just have to enjoy the time he did have. He placed his arm around Gine, knowing that their kids were onto further adventures, further heights. This is where our story leaves off, until 100 years later. We see a tournament arena surrounded by statues, Saiyans, humans, Namekians even, warriors of old, all related to the adventures the Saiyan family had. In the middle stood Bardock and King Vegeta, statues shining under the sunlight. In the middle of the arena clashed their descendants, showing off their Super Saiyan prowess. We zoom out to see people from all over the universe, warriors seeking out further strength. This is a whole planet, New Planet Vegeta, founded by the last king of the Saiyans. A safe haven for anyone across the universe seeking the thrill of battle. A new home not just for Saiyans, but for everyone. Vegeta had kept his promise. The Saiyan spirit lives on. The end. Thank you so much for watching everyone, this was one of the toughest videos I've ever had to make. This is just one stab at this idea though, and I kind of want to revisit it in the future and make a different version of the family story. But I did not do it alone, I had Chris Diaz, Ragmane, and Andrew all helping me out, each one editing parts of the story. I also have to give a huge thank you to Professor Chimp, I've had this story written for a long time, but he helped me quite a bit with the Dragon Ball Super sections of the story, the Goku Black arc and the Tournament of Power in particular. I really hope you all enjoyed, it was a great learning experience above all, and it only helped me make videos better in the future. As always, a huge thank you to the patrons of the channel and the members. Videos like this wouldn't be possible without you all, and if you're interested in watching videos like this early, then be sure to join the Patreon. I posted the whole cell arc early. If you like this video and are thirsting for more Dragon Ball, then why not check this one out, The Dragon Ball Iceberg, a whole hour plus of Dragon Ball facts. Thanks for watching everyone!